بس ما عنديش انا تضيح شويه باش نقعد قدام الشاشه هذه ما جابوا لي ميكرو صافيه احكي طلبوني syndicat des journalistes le syndicat des rédacteurs l'ex syndicat de allô انا على الهوا صرت لا انا معي ميكرو فيك تاخذني فيك تاخذ لي صوتي أه البول البول ما بدي انا اطلع انا قاعد واحد اثنين ثلاثة أربعة خمسة ستة سبعة ثمانية تسعة عشرة يلا طلعونا سهلة بالجميع بالجميع اللي لبوا الدعوة الكريمة لحتى يشوفوا صديقهم اللبناني اللي كل لبناني بيفتخر فيه الأستاذ كارلوس رسن مش اسم عادي يبدو أن المؤتمر بدأ وهناك تعريف حاليا في النقابة لأن المؤمنين فيه نستمع إلى التعريف قبل الانتقال إلى المؤتمر واللي بيعرف تاريخه للأستاذ كارلوس بيستغرب شو اللي عم بيصير صحيح أنه هو ولد في البرازيل وأول شركة كان فيها شركة فرنسوية مشلان وانتقل من هنيك على فرنسا ومن رجع فات على شركة رينو مساعد مدير عام بعدين صار مدير عام بسنة التسعة وتسعين صار في مشكلة كبيرة كتير عند النيسان النيسان كانت شركة مفلسة ما معهم مصاري وعليهم خمسة عشر مليار دولار راح هو كمدير كبير بشركة رينو وعمل اتفاق معهم واشتروا 30% من نيسان ووعد انه خلال اربع سنوات رح يقدر هو يوفي الديون اللي عليها ولكن الحمد لله قبل بثلاث سنين كان وافي الدين اللي على نيسان 
ما اكتفى باللسان بس كمان جاب الميتسوبيتشي ومن هون كبرت الدنيا كلها وما بدنا بدي اترك الكلام طبعا بس هيدي على نجاحاته اللي بيفتخر فيه كل لبناني وانا بحب اهلكم بهالموقع الجديد للنقابي اللي الله يرحمه ريمون نجار هو تبرع بهذا تاهيل هذا البناء وشكرا Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to uh, thank you for taking the time to be here with many of you traveling great distances to join me. Ça, c'est le seul endroit où je vais parler en plusieurs langues. Je voudrais aussi uh, uh, saluer uh, nos amis de la presse française qui nous ont rejoints. Wa ana habib kamen salim ala kul asdika al-Lebnaniye. أنا اليوم فخور كون لبناني لأنه إذا إذا في بلد بالعالم وقف معي بهالصعوبات هو لبنان. As you can imagine, today is a very important day for me. One that I have looked forward to every single day for more than 400 days since I was brutally taken from my world as I knew it. Ripped from my family, my friends, my communities, from Renault, Nissan, and Mitsubishi, and the 450,000 women and men who comprise those companies. I have not experienced a moment of freedom since November 19, 2018. It is impossible, it is impossible to express the depth of that deprivation, and my profound appreciation to once again be able to be reunited with my family and loved ones. Today is also a poignant reminder of the day precisely one year ago when I appeared before many of you as well as a Japanese judge and prosecutors in Tokyo. I pleaded my innocence by a did so while constrained by handcuffs and bound by a leash around my waist, which was used to walk me into the courtroom. I was in the midst of being held indefinitely in solitary confinement after several attempt, failed attempts at bail. I had just spent the Christmas and New Year holiday alone and in confinement, and I hadn't spoken to or seen my family for six weeks. My only contact with them were letters shown to me by lawyers through a looking glass. I had spent the previous months being interrogated for up to eight hours a day without any lawyers present without an understanding of what exactly I was being accused of, without access to the evidence that justify this travesty against my human rights and dignity. It will get worse for you if you don't just confess. The prosecutor told me repeatedly, and this has been taped. You can look at the tapes because the tapes are being held. You can see how many times they came up about you know, you just confess and it will be over. And if you don't confess, not only we're gonna go after you, we're gonna go after your family. And we're gonna discover many things. Every day I woke up on nights that I was able to sleep and to make a decision. Do I fight for my innocence or do I do as they say? And there was no end in sight. And those conditions remained more or less the same day after day, week after week, month after month. The feeling of hopelessness was profound. And every day for over 130 days in detention, I fought for my innocence. When I was finally granted bail for the first time and sought the opportunity to share with you all what I intend to share today, 
I was restlessly thrown back in solitary confinement within 24 hours, a confinement that flies in the face of global and United Nations standards of justice. This is why today is such an important occasion for me. I'm not here to talk about how I managed to leave Japan, although I can understand that you are interested in that. I'm here to talk about why I left. For the first time since this nightmare began, I can defend myself, speak freely, and answer your questions. It was very easy to beat on me why I was in prison. It was very, very easy to describe me the way I was described. Unfortunately, not only in Japan. But now, I'm going to be able to speak with facts and data and evidence, and hopefully you will discover the truth, not as it has been travestied by the people who are accusing me, or the people who join this accusation, or the accomplices, not only in Japan, but outside Japan, but the reality is very different, and hopefully today you're going to discover it with me. I'm not here to victimize myself. I'm here to shed light on a system that violates the most basic principles of humanity. I'm here to clear my name and to pronounce clearly and emphatically something that was interpreted as a heresy in the Japanese judicial system. These allegations are untrue and I should have never been arrested in the first place. First, I would like to begin by expressing my profound gratitude to those who supported me during this unspeakable ordeal. In the face of a systematic campaign by a handful of malevolent actors to destroy my reputation and impugn my character. I'm grateful beyond words for the steadfast love and support of my family, my wife, Carol, my four children, my three sisters, my mother, Rose, Carol's children and family, they all endured unimaginable pain. They learned of my arrest and solitary confinement through the media. They were barred from seeing me or even speaking to me for months. They were targeted by relentless, shameless, baseless media attacks orchestrated by Japanese prosecutors, Nissan executives, and unfortunately many accomplices. I think of my supportive friends, as well as the numerous anonymous individuals who sent me letters of support while I was in the detention center of Kosuge. I think of the Lebanese authorities and citizens who never lost their face in me. They showed the world that for a small country, Lebanese people have a big soul, they have a big heart, and a true sense of righteousness. I think, I think of my lawyers around the globe who wage a valiant battle putting their career on the line and devoting their full energy against a corrupt and hostile system that presumed my guilt from day one and was designed to break my spirit and coerce my confession. I also want to thank the human rights and criminal justice advocates globally and particularly in Japan who have fought tirelessly against insuperable odds to improve Japan's anachronistic and inhumane system of hostage justice. It is a system that is indifferent to the truth, indifferent to fairness and process, indifferent to fundamental civil liberties and accepted norms of justice. I also want to take a moment to mention Greg Kelly, an honorable man, husband and father, who was brutally torn from his word and his family on that November day, summoned to Tokyo under false pretenses by Harry Nada when he needed to stay home for an important surgery. Greg remains a victim of the Japanese hostage justice system with no trial date inside 14 months after his arrest. While my plight has captured the headline, we and you cannot forget Greg's ordeal and the pain he and family endure each day at the hands of the Japanese system. He is being punished precisely because he is honorable and refused to participate in a suspicious 
plea bargaining agreement alongside Harinada and Onuma and probably many others. Thanks to the systematic leaking of false information and distorted information and the intentional withholding of exculpatory information by the prosecutor and by Nissan, I was presumed guilty before the eyes of the world and subject to a system whose only objective is to coerce confessions, secure guilty pleas without regard to the truth. I have come to learn that my unimaginable ordeal over the past 14 months is the result of a handful of unscrupulous vindictive individuals at Nissan, at the Latam and Watkins law firm with the support of the Tokyo prosecutor office. It is important for me to emphasize that I'm not above the law and I welcome the opportunity for the truth to come out and to have my name vindicated and my reputation restored. I did not escape justice. I fled injustice and persecution, political persecution. Having endured more than 400 days of inhumane treatment in a system designed to break me and unwilling to provide me even minimal justice, I was left with no other choice but to protect myself and my family. It was a difficult decision and a risk one only takes if resigned to the impossibility of a fair trial. With the strings being pulled and manipulated by those dead set on securing a confession or a conviction whose only goal is to save face. The facts, the truth, justice are irrelevant to these individuals. This was the most difficult decision of my life, but let us not forget that I was facing a system where the conviction rate is 99.4%. And I will bet you that this number is much higher for the foreigners. The legitimacy of a justice system should not rest on its conviction rate, but instead on the confidence that it searches for and honors truth and dispenses fair and just outcomes. It is the prosecutors aided and abetted by petty, vindictive, and lawless individuals. In government at Nissan and, and the Latam law firm who have destroyed and are destroying Japan reputation on the global stage, it is them who are fueling an archaic, manipulative, arbitrary side to an otherwise modern country. It is them who should be held accountable. The charges against me are baseless. Why do you think the prosecutors have leaked false information to the press against the Japanese law? Why have they intentionally concealed exculpatory evidence that support my innocence? We're gonna see it. Why have they continually delayed the still undetermined 13 months after the still undetermined trial date and extended the relentlessly the in investigation timeline? Why have they re-arrested me and seized all my legal defense documents? Why were they so intent on preventing me from talking and holding a press conference where I would set forth the facts and my side of the story? Why have they spent 14 months trying to break my spirit banning me from all contact with my wife and surveying my every move. Let me, before going to your question, and I know you have many, try to give you some answer. And I'm gonna follow particularly five topics. The first topic is why all of this happened? At the beginning, why all of this happened? The second is how did it happen? I'm gonna tell you a little bit of what I've been through for 14 months. Third is, we're gonna come back to the four charges that the prosecutor have put on me. And I'm gonna explain to you the charges. We're gonna also talk about all the charges that have been at the base of what I call the smear campaign, that the prosecutor didn't dare even put them in the accusation, but they are flying through the media with many fantasy interpretation, and unfortunately with some official position which are absolutely not rigorous on them. And finally, I'm gonna give you some words about the lines Renault and Nissan. Where are they today, one year later? What is the situation of, the three, of these three entities one year later? 
And then I will uh, let you answer on your question. So let me start with the first item, which is why? Okay, if we say, okay, this is a plot, and this is something which has been organized, why? What are the reasons for this? Well, we have uh, two reasons. There are probably many, but I'm going to give you the main one. The two main reasons for this to happen. The first one was the fact that Nissan performance unfortunately started to decline at the beginning of 2017. I will remind you that in October 2016, I have decided to remove myself from the operation of Nissan because I signed the deal with Mitsubishi, taking control of 34% of Mitsubishi, and Mitsubishi needed help. So I moved to Mitsubishi as chairman of the board, as future chairman of the board, to support Masuko-san into reviving this company. And I told Saikawa-san, okay, I'm gonna, we're going to propose you as co-CEO. Yeah, well, this is also something we should say. The CEOs are not no named by their predecessor. They are named by the board. They are proposed by the predecessor, but it is the board decision. So when people say, oh, Monsieur Bolloré was named by Mr. Gon, wrong. Mr. Bolloré was named by the board. He was proposed by Carlos Gon, but he was named by the board. So when they say, oh, he was named by Mr. Gon, that means he has no legitimacy. It's dead wrong. It's not factual. The members of the board of Renault voted unanimously, unanimously to nominate him as CEO. And nine months later, that unanimously voted him down. That's the reality. So let's come back to our story about Saikawa. Nominated in October 2016, CEO of the company. I moved to Mitsubishi. I told him, now it's your turn. I promise that one day I will return this company after having been CEO for 17 years. After having been CEO for 17 years of a dead company in 1999, I left with him $20 billion in cash, a company which was profitable, which was growing, which was respected, a brand which was nowhere in 1999, which became one of the top 60 brands in the world. That's what I left with him. I tell him, you take care of it, now it's your turn. Let me help Mitsubishi, let me take care of Renault, and let me take care of the lines. Unfortunately, you know, a CEO is here as long as he performs. I, mean, I didn't stay 17 years head of Nissan because I was Carlos Ghosn. I was there only because I was performing. I was delivering growth, I was delivering profit, I was delivering cash flow, I was delivering dividends. That's our reason to be. Unfortunately, we started in 17 to see a decline in the performance of the company. <clears throat> Obviously, many tough discussions. In 2018, another decline, many tough discussions. But at the same time, he was the CEO and he was responsible for it. So he has to find the solution with his own team. So there was some nervousness in the ranks of the top management and particular ranks in the top management that at a certain point in time, patience will run out and change will come. That's number one. Number two, well, <coughs> we have to come back to the history of the lines. You know, there was a famous Florence Law in France that has been voted, given double voting rights for uh, the shareholders who have more than two years. We, as board of Renault, opposed this rule. And we have the right because the law allowed us, if there is more than two-thirds of the shareholders voting to pass over this rule, it was possible. We didn't prevail because, as you know, the French state increased its stake into the company, blocked the majority of two-thirds. We have most of the shareholders with us, but we were not able to reach the, 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 the two-thirds of the shares. This left a big bitterness with our friends in Japan. Not only with our, the management of Nissan, but also with the government of Japan. And this left a big stage because somehow they considered that it is unfair that Nissan, who owns 15% of shares in Renault, has zero voting rights, and that the French state, which owns 15% of Renault, has double voting rights. We tried to explain it. We were not successful, unfortunately. And this is where the problem started because there started to be some kind of defiance from our Japanese colleagues, not only about the lines, but also about me, particularly when I've been asked 
before renewing my mandate, which by the way, I didn't ask for. I was ready to retire before June 2018. I was asked that I was the, probably the best person to continue for the next step of the lines. And unfortunately, I accepted this offer. And probably one of the reasons for which I'm in this situation today is because I accepted this offer to continue to integrate the two companies, converge the two companies, always respecting the autonomy of each company because this is a management belief that you're not going to make a strong company with people who are thinking they are second-rate citizens in a big organization. I want the Japanese to be proud of Alliance. I want Renault to be proud of the Alliance. I didn't want a first-rate citizen and a second-rate citizen. I want each company to be totally, and there was a system, I proposed a system to maintain that even though I made the Alliance irreversible. Unfortunately, there was no trust. And some of our Japanese friends thought, the only way to get rid of the influence of Renault on Nissan is to get rid of me, which unfortunately they were right, because when you see exactly what's happening today, where uh, Renault has very little influence on what's going on in Nissan, even though they put a nice face on what's, what's, what's taking place, you know exactly that the Japanese have the right analysis by saying, we get rid of him, we will get much more autonomy for Nissan. Unfortunately, as you know, we're going to talk about the results. The results that were expected are not the one that everybody was hoping for. So, who are the people? I promise you names. I'm going to give you names. Okay? Who was part of the plot? Obviously, Saikawa is part of the plot. Harinada is part of the plot, obviously, and Onuma, because they showed. But there are many other people. Toyoda, member of the board, was the link between the board of Nissan, Nissan, and the authorities. Now, I can talk about what happens in the government of Japan. I can give you names, I know them. But I am in Lebanon, I respect Lebanon, and I respect the hospitality that has extend, been extended to me by the authorities in Lebanon. And in no way I want to do anything or say anything that would make their task more difficult. So I'm imposing on myself silence on this part of the presentation because in no way I want to show anything or say anything that would hurt the interest of the Lebanese people or the Lebanese government. So I will stop there for the government. Kawaguchi, Imazu, chief auditor, Toyoda, these are the main people. Obviously there are many other people participating to it, but I have all the names I'm limiting to the, to the, to the main people who are involved. The, the prosecutor, uh, I will mention some of the names. You're going to have the people who have been from all the side of the fences, like uh, the uh, lawyer uh, company, uh, uh, LW, that Nissan, that we were using in the past and continue to help Nissan, even though attacking some of the advice that they have given us when we were in charge and now they are supporting the new team. So the story is very long, but I'm going to limit myself. How? Decline of the performance of Nissan, suspicion about the next step of the irreversibility of the lines. These are the two reasons for which this happened. How? I was arrested on November 19, 2018. I didn't suspect anything. And I didn't suspect anything because I was not anymore the CEO of the company, I was chairman. And now I delegate, I delegate. <coughs> Some people ask me, oh my God, that means you didn't look at this, you didn't mention this, you didn't suspect this. And it happened that it was a colleague, one of your colleagues from the US, and I say, you know, what happened in Pearl Harbor? Did you see Pearl Harbor happening? Did you see Pearl Harbor happening? Did you notice what happened in Pearl Harbor? You know? So you're telling me, you're asking me how did I notice? And I was not even in my country that something like this was being cooked against me. And you're telling me how I didn't notice, I didn't notice it. And I didn't notice it because it is true that when it's planned and it's confidential and it's secret, well, it happens. And you'll be surprised. And I was surprised. There was a stage arrest. I've been told, I didn't know, that the world was led to know that I was arrested in the airplane. 
bullshit. I was arrested in the airport. I came down from the airplane. I was taken in a car. I arrived to the passport. They told me there is a problem with my visa. They took me in a small room, and this is where I found Seki prosecutor telling me, I'm from the prosecutor office. I need to talk to you. And since then, say, you cannot use anymore your phone, and I know I was arrested. I don't understand what's going on. <coughs> and because I was surprised, I told him, okay, can I at least give a phone call to Nissan to send a lawyer? Well, obviously, I didn't know that Nissan was behind it. And it was all staged way before between the prosecutor and the company. This is the way it happened. And from there, they took me to Kosugi Detention Center. It took five hours between my arrest and me finding myself into a tiny cell in Kosugi. The collusion between Nissan and the prosecutor is everywhere. The only people who don't see it, maybe, are the people in Japan. They don't see this collusion. And I've been told this is totally illegal. How can it be illegal? And at the same time, we have so many traces, so many hands on the wall, and nobody's talking about them. Well, you don't see it, you don't want to see it. But the collusion between Nissan and the prosecutor is coming through witnesses who were in the headquarters of Nissan, who told me exactly what happened before I was arrested, all the preparation, all the visits, a lot of the meeting that took place between the prosecutors and Nissan, at least without counting officials. And, and I'm not going to talk about the official, as I said. So I was sent to the prison, and the prosecutor told me, well, we're going to arrest you for underreporting your compensation. I was shocked at the beginning. Frankly, I, I, I couldn't understand that. I say, a comp what compensation? And he said, yeah, yeah, we are arresting you for underreporting a compensation that was not paid to you. Second surprise. OK, so we're talking about something which was not paid for me. Yes. And then something which didn't go to the board, which means that it did not decide it. So I was arrested for a compensation that was not fixed, that was not decided, and that was not paid. This is the reason of my arrest. This is the reason of my arrest. Well, I can tell you that in many countries, there is no reason to arrest. It's certainly not a criminal case. It's certainly not a, even an offense. Give you a name you know very well. Tanaka-san, professor of corporate law, Tokyo University consulted three weeks ago by my lawyers. They put everything. Now that we have the documents, at least on the first charge from the prosecutor, again, 13 months after the arrest, we showed him everything. And we told him, Professor, please tell us. He said, I'm quoting him, it is a shame that Japan arrested Mr. Gon for this. So we asked him to write, and he's going to write. Obviously, I don't know if he's going to continue to write it now. But he said, it's a shame, Professor Tanaka, University of Tokyo, corporate law. It's a shame that Mr. Gon was arrested for this. Let me continue. So in, let me talk to you and a little bit. I'm not going to talk too much about it. 130 days in prison, solitary confinement, tiny cell without window, light day and night. 30 minutes per day, excluding weekend, because obviously there is not enough guard in the weekend. You can't go for 30 minutes outside. When there is a holiday, there is nobody. So you stay in your cell. You just get your food. For example, six days without any human contact during the New Year break. Shower twice a week. Try to ask to have more. They said no. Prescribed medication is forbidden. You can get only the medicine from the prison. Interrogated days and night. It can happen in the morning, in the afternoon, at night, up to eight hours, obviously without the presence of a lawyer. All of this is taped. Impossible to take to anyone. No one speaks English or French or anything. When we need something important, we have to bring somebody, and this guy is available once a week. Presumption of guilt prevail. Prosecutor from the beginning, you know, they let me to know you're guilty. You know, don't play games, confess. And everything they were asking me is not to try to discover the truth, it's to try to find reason to make sure that their accusation will be stronger. So I felt from the beginning that there was no interest into finding the truth. 
every they was interested into trying to build a very strong case against me. And sent back to prison the day before the press conference to stop me from speaking out. Which is interesting is that after I was bailed out the second time, a new prosecutor in Japan has been nominated, and he was interviewed by the Japanese media. And Japanese media said, Ma, Mr. Prosecutor, why do you forbid Mr. Gon to talk to the press? He said, oh, no, we don't. We don't. He can't talk to the press. But we also can bring new charges, which was a, a very simple message that, OK, yes, sure, he can talk to the press. But watch, and we can bring new charges. And they're very good at bringing charges because, as you know, yesterday, what a coincidence, yesterday, Obviously, they can't put me back in prison, but they asked, they put a warrant arrest for my wife yesterday. On what? On declaration she made nine months ago in front of the judge and with the prosecutor. And what is the reason? They said, oh, we suspect she said something which was wrong. Nine months later? You discovered this nine months later? One day before this press conference? What a coincidence. What a coincidence. This is exactly the way it works. You talk, you go back to Kosugi. Nine months separated from my wife without any motive. Carol has a lot of courage. After I've been arrested, she left the country. Prosecutor asked her, why leaving the country? Well, obviously, they took her passport. They were very threatening. They left her without a telephone. They got her computer. She was left alone in Tokyo without anything. She left because she was afraid. But then when they start to say, oh, she has something to hide, she came back. Four days later, she flew back. They interrogated her in front of the court with the judge and the prosecutor. And then she left. And now they're issuing a warrant for false testimony nine months later. Let me give you another example. The judge in charge of the bail condition Hajime Shimada. We asked him seven times to remove the ban over a period of nine months. Seven times. And every time he took the time to think, nothing changed, huh? And then he came back by saying no. And why no? Because tampering of evidence. Tampering of evidence for Carol. But I was able to receive my sisters. I was able to receive my kids. I was able to receive my cousins, my friends. So if I was intending to tamper evidence, I could tamper evidence with anybody. Why, Carol? Because they knew that by not allowing me to have a normal life, they were breaking me. And which is interesting is when we tell Shimada-san, Shimada-san, you know, maybe they can meet from time to time under your control. And the question was very interesting. It was saying, why do they want to meet? And we said, okay, how about a Zoom, a conference? He said, what do I want to talk about? I felt like I was not a human anymore. I was something between a human, an animal, or an object. But I mean, there is no feeling that a man and a woman who are married want to talk together, and I have to explain why I have to talk to my wife? I didn't care. And the answer, as you know, was no. And I had the right for two hours, two hours in nine months, with a lawyer present in the room, and the poor guy was embarrassed. He, 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 he just tell me, please excuse me, I have to be here, and I have to report about what did you say to your wife. That's what you're talking about. The second one that I would like to mention also, I mentioned I had many pre-trial sessions. In the pre-trial session, you have the prosecutor, you have the defense, and you have the judge. Three judges. Well. I was naive. I thought that the judge was a boss. Well, I was wrong. The boss was the prosecutor. The judge, Kenji Shimotsu, very nice guy, very polite. But the prosecutor did whatever they want. When they were late, they say, we're sorry, we're late. We're busy. When they ask, why don't you bring this document this day? They say, we're going to think about it. Then the date comes, they say, we're late, we're not giving it. And why all of this? Try as much as possible to delay the trial. And when I left Japan, I still did not have a date for the first charge. Didn't have a date for the first charge. 
Then they came with the idea about saying, oh, we cannot put all the trials at the same time. We have to finish the first charge before we start the second one. So when I asked my lawyers about how much time all, all of this is going to take, saying we're afraid you're going to be maybe five years in Japan before I get a judgment. Five years in Japan. This is, I understand, we have Maître Zimri, who is here, who is a specialist in human rights. Speedy trial is one of the basic and most fundamental right of any human being, part of the treaty of human rights. Well, I was far from a speedy trial. On the contrary, I had the impression that that can take as much time as possible. And, you know, with the judge being a kind of nice organizer of the whole things and the prosecutor calling the shots. 99.4% conviction rate, all the signs that there was no way I was going to be treated fairly, no sign that I will have a normal life for the next four or five years. So I can tell you, that means it's not very difficult to come to conclusion, you're gonna die in Japan or you're gonna have to get out. This was not about justice. This was, as I felt I was a hostage of a country that I have served for 17 years. I dedicated my professional life, I was proud of it. I revived a company that nobody else before me was able to do for 10 years. They were in the dirt. I brought them for 17 years. I was considered as a role model in Japan. More than 20 books of management were written about me. And like this in, in a minute, all of a sudden, few prosecutor and a bunch of executives in this town say, you know what? This guy is a cold, cold, greedy dictator. That's what I said. Cold, greedy dictator. We filed motion to dismiss because of the, all the elements that the prosecutor violated. Obviously, this motion is still being analyzed. And then there is an endless search for new charges by the prosecutor. So in a certain way, you know, I, I think we have the list. Yeah, we have here the list of all the prosecutor misconducts that have been presented with evidence and with uh, facts and with data and with name and with testimony that were presented to the court just to ask for the case to be dismissed. But my lawyers in Japan told me, you know, don't think that it will be dismissed. There is zero case in Japan where whatever is the reason of dismissal, a case was dismissed. Some people were acquitted, it's part of the 0.6% left, but there is zero case of dismissal. Let me go now to the accusation. The first accusation is the underreporting. This is the main accusation for which I was arrested. Again, amount of money not fixed, not decided, not paid. What's interesting also, I'm gonna give you some interesting fact, is that Nissan <laughs> pleaded guilty in Japan by saying, oh, we're sorry, we're gonna provision 9 billion yen recently, and we're gonna plead guilty in Japan. And the India has to pay a fine. Good citizen. The problem is that in Tennessee, where there is a lawsuit against them, they took the opposite position. Their lawyer said, well, we're not guilty, there is no reason, there is no reason. And this document is available for you. In Japan, we're guilty, that's what Nissan said. In Tennessee, they said, we're not guilty. So, this document is available, we are sublined. The, the, key, the key sentences saying that, I just wanted to mention this for you and we'll come back during the question, uh, the question and answer. And again, there is no democratic country I know where you go for jail for this kind of accusation, even if they were right. <coughs> Shinsei Bank. Shinsei Bank, there is a resolution from the board. This is a board resolution. Interesting, in the board resolution, everybody voted unanimously for a resolution saying, if a foreign director or a foreign, foreign officer, foreign officer want to have a contract of exchange rate to cover his income, he can do it at no cost for the company. 
Who was present? Well, some people you know. Carlos Tavares was member of the board. You have Saikawa, member of the board. They all signed on this. No cost for the company. Very good. I benefited from it. No cost for the company. No cost for the company. No loss for the company. Again, we return by saying, where is the problem? Where is the problem? We continue. Jufali. Ah, this is another one. Where they say, ah, Mr. Gohan, Jufali didn't do nothing. He received $14.7 million from Nissan on four years, but he did do nothing. This is the accusation. He did do nothing. Well, uh, we have a contract. We found finally, we got the contract about what Jufali was doing. What are the documents that were signed between Jufali and many executives inside Nissan? But particularly, I want to attract your attention to the fact that, you know, there have been a lot of articles saying, you know, CEO reserve. Oh my God, this is the kind of secret money that Carlos Ghosn, you know, open a safe, has a lot of cash distributed to his friend. He can do whatever he wants. CEO reserve is a line in the budget. That's what it is. You can access CEO reserve, but it is a line in the budget. It has no payment, it's no cash, it's nothing at all. This is one indication of the CEO reserve. How does it go? You have a vice president asking for the money. In this case, it's Gilles Normand, who was the head of the region. Then he has to explain why he wants the money and what is the contract which is based. And then you have many people reviewing it and agreeing on it or not. Well, obviously you have legal, then you have the controller, then you have the boss of this guy, who usually is the head of the operation, then there is me. Why? Because if it's called CEO Reserve, I have to accept that. Every single payment from CEO Reserve follow the same procedure. There is not one dollar paid from CEO Reserve with my signature alone. You have all these people signing on, and, and after this, after you agree on the budget line, then it has to go for the payment. And when you go for the payment, you have many other people having to sign. Local controller, local vice president, uh, obviously the people receiving the money, etc., etc. So all this farce, talking about CO reserve as a kind of being special things where Carlos Ghosn was taking money, giving it to his friend. It doesn't stand one minute. We have all the evidence showing that. We have all the documents, fortunately now, because you know, when I was arrested, they took everything from me. I had no computer, no file, no in Renault or in Nissan, nothing. Everything was taken. So I have to reconstitute everything, everything to defend myself. And obviously, I'm using here some of the documents that the prosecutor have at the end to deliver to us in order to allow us to defend ourselves. <coughs> we also, I would like to show you, uh, can we move to Ananda Sass, uh, to the declaration of different people? Yeah. Then, then we have a lot of statements. Prosecutors in Japan have been visiting many people making statements. Never heard about them. We heard about them because they were obliged to give it to them. One of the important statements is Gilles Normand. Why Gilles Normand? He was the vice president in charge of the Middle East for Nissan. Another one is Joe Peter. Joe Peter was the chief financial officer of Nissan. Another one is Alain Dassas, also another chief financial officer. They covered all these areas. And when we look at what they are saying in all these documents, and these documents are available. You can consult them, and we make them available for those who want to look at them. So when we are uh, looking at that, what do they say? They say the Middle East was an important region for Carlos Ghosn because Toyota is, is one of the main profit center of Toyota, and it's not one of the main profit center of Nissan. And as you know, the Middle East is practically an Asian country. The cars selling are Japanese cars, and Korean cars. And then obviously you have some Mercedes and BMW, but the European have practically no position in the Middle East, or very weak position. I'm talking particularly about the Gulf. So I want to push the people to say, okay, let's go on the offensive. We have an opportunity, not only in volume, but also in profit. And we need to change the way we do business. We need to innovate in, in, in the way we do business. Pushing people to partner with the local dealer, that's what Toyota does. They don't have their own bureaucrats going into the region trying to do what they do. They say, no, no, we have a good dealer. Let's work with him. Let's give him support. Let's give him incentive. Let him do the job for us. And frankly, it delivered for us. Because every time we did this, we had higher sales and higher profits. All of this is argumented. And the presentation made by the uh, prosecutor is, oh, Mr. Ghosn has special ties with the Saudi guy and with Ahmad Bahwan. 
and Suhail Bahwan in Oman. So they had this kind of very cozy relationship. Well, in fact, everything we did with Oman, we did it with Dubai, we did it with Lebanon, we did it with Qatar. They're not talking about the other one. They're just focusing on, oh, these incentives are very big. And what's interesting is when you compare the incentive paid to these people, it's totally normal. And even below the level of incentive that competitors are seeing. But this is something you never heard about. Potential of the Middle East is very important. And that's what we were going after. Ahmed Bawan, let's go to the next one, has been viewed by the prosecutor, never heard about it, huh? He was reviewed by the prosecutor in Japan. He was interrogated for one day, never heard about it. Why? Because obviously, <laughs> he didn't say what they were expecting him to say. He denied all of the accusation, and he denied all the accusation knowing that obviously nobody's gonna believe him. They're gonna say, yeah, but if you are accomplice, well, in a certain way, you may say something different than the truth, but you need to know that all the bank accounts, my bank accounts, Bahwan bank accounts, Kumar bank accounts, Jufali bank accounts, have all been swept, all of them. All bank accounts in the world. So if there was any, any payment which was suspicious, I can tell you, it would be front page of the Nikkei or of the Sankei before it will come, it will come directly with the, by the prosecutor. So, <laughs> Then people say, okay, so what is the story with Kumar? I say, well, if a breach of trust is, there is the money from Nissan going from Nissan and ended up with you, well, there is no money from Nissan because the money in Nissan stops at Suhail Bahwan Automotive, period. And Kumar has nothing to do with it. And we have all the evidence of that, that there was absolutely no transfer indicating that there was any money from Nissan benefiting Kumar. So, end of the road, there's no breach of trust, because breach of trust is, there is money of the company which is benefiting the executive of the company. I'm sure we'll come back on this. So, let's continue on character assassination. This is, I must say that they've been very successful. As you know, Nissan hired a lot of people. I read in Bloomberg recently that they spent more than $200 million for the investigation and for everything around this, $200 million to get how much money? How much money is that saved? They're talking about $14.7 million with Jufali that was paid to Jufali and $5 million for Bahwan. So how is, how rationally you're gonna say, you're gonna spend $200 million. You're gonna destroy your company. You're gonna destroy your brand. You're gonna destroy your image. You're gonna divert the attention of all your top management. You're taking a big risk with the lines. And by the way, the market cap decrease of Nissan since my arrest is more than $10 billion. They lost more than $40 million a day during all this period. By the way, Renault is not better because the market cap of Renault went down since my arrest by more than 5 billion euro, which means 20 million euro a day of quotation. 20 million euro a day. So, when I hear a statement made by a French official saying, we need to concentrate on the 11 million euro of undefined expenses, I say, yes, sure. Why don't you come to me? I'll explain it to you. Nobody came to me. You make an audit. Well, the first person that should be, if for the audit to be valid, the contradictory of it, you should come to the main person and ask him the question. If you're not convinced by the question, then it's fine. But you don't even come to me to tell me about the planes, about the help to universities, the help to school. You know, you, you're not come to me and you just say unexplained expenses. I don't worry about these 11 million euro because I have an explanation. I worry as a shareholder of Renault about the fact that I lost 35% of value and I still don't understand why. I worry when Renault goes down by all this amount the automotive industry is up 12%. So the only companies which went down in market cap for this period of time are, what a coincidence, Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi. And everything else on average went up 12%. So why a company is made? It's what? It's about what? It's about, uh, you know, it's mainly it's about creation of value, if I remember. A CEO is here for a creation of value. A board is here to protect shareholders. 
Where are we here? Where I'm a little bit lost as a shareholder of Renault and a shareholder of Nissan. I say, oh my God, who's protecting me as a shareholder? Who is caring about me? Where is the name of the brand? What's the future of the brand? Let's go to character assassination. Make the big story about Versailles. Versailles. Some people think I'm in prison because of Versailles. No, no, it's true. I mean, some people say, okay. First Versailles, first accusation, Mr. Gone, you make a 15 years anniversary of the alliance in Versailles. Yes, sure. Why Versailles? It, Versailles is not Louis XIV. Versailles is the most visited site in France. It's a symbol of the genius that France has. It's a symbol of the opening to the world. If the symbol of the globalization of France, you talk about Versailles, any foreigner will come to Versailles. They are amazed by the beauty, by the attraction, by the gardens. That's why we sold Versailles. It's not because you want to mimic Louis XIV or you want to mimic Marie Antoinette. It's ridiculous. We made it and they say, oh, this was a party of birthday. We say, well, hey, I made a speech. Where is the speech? Speech is up here. All of a sudden, I can't get the speech I made, which was a corporate speech where I thank all the people for the support they've given to the alliance. But people say, hey, but why the other executive of Renault and Nissan were not here? Well, it was not for the executive. We had a celebration with the executive, which was different. This was for the partners, and particularly with the foreign partners. If you invite somebody in France to go to Versailles, he doesn't care. But if you invite an American, a Chinese, a Japanese to go to Versailles, they all run. They all run. That's the reason of Versailles. But the suspicion is, hmm, this was a birthday party. Okay, character assassination. Second one. You have the unfortunate reservation of a room in Versailles. <coughs> Can we have, yeah. This is the bill. Who took care, that, that, let me tell you how it happened. We were big sponsors of Versailles. Why? Because you know that Versailles doesn't have enough money to maintain the building. So they go to large corporation. They came to me and say, Mr. Gon, can you help us? I said, fine, because the image of Versailles fits with the image of the lines, it fits with the image of Renault. Let's do it. I agreed. So we supported many things in Versailles. We supported recently the fact that we have redone Le Salon de la Paix. It was in a situation which was, frankly, horrible. We paid more than one million euro. Well, hopefully it didn't come as a breach of trust that I'm using the money of the company for something in which Renault may not be interested. It didn't come. One million euro for the, for the, to redo the Salon de la Paix. So the image of Versailles is this one. So Catherine Pégard, who is the head of Versailles, told me, Mr. Gon, you are a big benefactor, you know, from time to time for our big friends, we can make rooms available. If you have a private party, we can make room available. I say, thank you very much. And then many months has passed. All of a sudden, I had the possibility for Carol's 50th birthday. She was telling me, okay, we need to have our friends coming from Lebanon and from the United States. I say, you know what, maybe Versailles can be an interesting place. I had this proposal from Pega. Called Pega, she said, no problem. We put somebody in charge, obviously we're not going to do it. This is the company, CMP. CMP put all the expenses, you have them here, and then they put rental of the room. Offered by Versailles, it's written on the document by the people who organize it. And they put zero euro. Okay, so you know, when I see this, I say, okay, it's a commercial gesture. You know, they are appreciative, etc. That's fine. We're going to make their own traiteur work. We're going to use their own people. Because obviously this is not a very cheap uh, party. So then I was surprised to see that this cost 50,000 euro because I don't know what happened behind the scene. Somebody went and said, no, you know what? We cannot pay 50,000. We cannot give as a present 50,000 euro. We're going to deduct it from the credit that Renault earns by being a sponsor of Versailles. We said, okay, we're ready to pay. We didn't know. And we have all the documents to prove and all the people involved that we didn't know about it. Nobody tells us. We thought that in good faith, this was a kind of commercial gesture, which by the way, benefiting Versailles because we use all the people who are working in Versailles. The houses, you say, oh, Mr. Gone, you have a house in Rio de Janeiro, house in Beirut, come on. Well, the houses all belong to Nissan. And say, oh my God, we are discovering this. You've done it secretly. Secretly? Let me show you the document. 
This is a document signed by the two representative directors of Nissan, Greg Kelly and Hiroto Saikawa, 2013. And what this document says, use of company residential accommodation, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Beirut, Lebanon. Use it. And they say also that as long as he's working for the company and we are committing that these houses can be sold back to him at book value at the end. So when I hear that everybody was surprised and we were doing this hidden, I say, oh my God. I mean, what kind of document you want more than this where you two representative director plus legal, finance, treasury, the re regional people who bought, who wrote this document, that means the whole thing doesn't make sense. Part of, by the way, this is not at, at all part of the charges, but this is part of the character assassination. The media jump on it. Let's continue. My sister Claudine, contract with my sister Claudine. They say, ah, this is also, they make a contract, she didn't do anything. Well, she didn't do anything. Well, one of the reasons for which she was there, because she was the head of the Chamber of Commerce in Rio de Janeiro, and she was key for really benefiting from a huge incentive package and selecting Rio de Janeiro for the building of a more than $1 billion plant in, in Resende, in Rio de Janeiro, which is, exists today in, in Nissan. So, we, all the doctors, who were aware? Well, two representative directors are aware. The head of the operation of Brazil was aware. All the people who wired the money, transferred the money, were aware of it. Obviously, now, people say, yeah, we're not sure. I mean, when Saikawa was asked about, hey, by the way, you signed this document. He said, yeah, I signed it. I read it in the press. Huh? Probably he said something like, he said, but I didn't pay attention. Or I didn't understand why I was signing this. But this kind of argument with him goes well with the prosecutor. That won't go well with me, but they go well with him. So let me go to the last point, that RNBV. RNBV audit made by Mazar. You know that they went with an interim audit report to the board of Renault, interim audit report. And after they've seen the interim audit report, Renault communicated and some official of the government communicated the result of an audit which is not finished before even I have the opportunity to interface with them. They had many questions for me. They had many questions for me, but they didn't even have the opportunity to ask me this. So this so-called audit, which is absolutely not contradictory, which is gonna be the object, if I understand very well, of a legal battle, well, it didn't follow any one of the rules of the audit, and the first element of an audit is the contradictory the fact that you are exposed to the results and you have to explain what's going on. This did not happen. And you know, we are treating Renault, Nissan and RNBV as small pop and mom shops. Like there is no controller, there is no finance, there is no auditors, there is no outside people. All the bills are being reviewed, not only internally but externally. All the explanations are being made. So people think that these kind of things can happen without anybody, you know, without anybody, just a couple of people signing on it. This follow a protocol which is extremely rigorous. And I can tell you, RNBV had the same protocol than Renault and Nissan. Let me go for the last point before probably making a, a break before going to your question and answer. Then you say, why all of this? What is the consequence of all of this? You know, it's difficult to know who, who's the winner of this. Who, who at the end of the day, who prevailed into this? Well, in 2017, the Lions was the number one automotive group with three companies, Renault, Nissan, and Mitsubishi, growing, profitable, with a clear vision for the future, strategy, bold strategy. And you know very well that we were preparing to add Fiat Chrysler to the group because I was negotiating with John Elkan for Fiat Chrysler to join. So we had the strategy, we know where we were going, we know how the synergies work. This was the situation in 2017. We look today, well, frankly, there is no more alliance. And if somebody said, well, why you guys are together? Because it looks like all the decisions are made are consensual. Well, I've been managing this entity for 17 years. I can tell you consensus doesn't work. It doesn't work. You have to make sure that you force people to go for synergies 
you make sure that they adhere to the synergies, you spend time to explain to them why the synergies are important, but you leave them to themselves and you say it's consensual, nothing happens. And by the way, we saw it in the results of the companies. So, the three companies, Alliance disappeared, no longer works, and the three company, the growth has disappeared, profits are down. I'm a hard, finding a hard time to see any strategic direction. No more technological innovation coming, and no more. And on top of this, the line missed the unmissable, which is Fiat Chrysler. Le didn't go with the lines, they go with PSA. But it's unbelievable. How can you lose that? How can you lose this huge opportunity to become the dominant player in this industry by developing ties with people who were eager to join you, who were totally complementary to the alliance? Obviously, you're going to have 15 explanations telling you, you know what, it's because of gone, because, you know, this and that and that. Everything is on me now, okay? But it is unbelievable that this didn't happen. It's unbelievable. So, <coughs> the, what I would like to say is, this is not a common case where you say, oh, Mr. Gone, you know what? You know, he didn't, uh, and, and the media, sometimes they say he didn't pay taxes, no taxes involved. You know, he hidden compensation. When I tell people I didn't receive any compensation, they are surprised. But the whole story has been put in a way to lead people to think something which is different from the reality. Okay? And it, I must admit, they are very good at it. This is probably the only way. This is the only thing on which they are good. Because on everything else, which is the raison sociale of a car maker, is to make good cars, sell a lot of them, develop the technology, see the car of the future, make a profit, make cash, pay a good dividend, and increase the shareholders. Yeah. They said, we want to turn the go on page. Well, they've been very successful. They turned the gone page. They turned the gone page because there is no more growth. There is no more increase of profit. There is no more strategic initiatives. There is no more technology and there is no more alliance. What we see today is a masquerade of an alliance that obviously with all the people who are involved is not gonna go anywhere. So <laughs> that's why I'm telling you this is political. This is political. There is a lot of tentative to present it as a you know, common case of somebody who has crossed boundaries. No, there is no crossing of boundaries. I am innocent of all the charges, all of them. And I can prove it now because I start to have a lot of documents and there are many more documents to come. And that's what I want to say, to, uh, to say today. I left Japan because I wanted justice. That's why I left Japan. I didn't run from justice. I want justice because justice is the only way I'm going to establish my reputation and the only way what I've done during my life is going to be recognized to its value. And if I can't, don't get it in Japan, I'm going to get it somewhere else. Thank you for your attention. And um, now uh, let me, before, uh, before we make the, we make the, the break, just final point, particularly for our Japanese friend. I was painted in the media in, in, in Japan, cold, greedy dictator. That's it. Everything is cold, greedy dictator. Cold saying, he doesn't like Japan. He doesn't like Japanese. He's a kind of mercenary here for the money. It's wrong. I like Japan. I like the people in Japan. I can tell you that for the many months where I was on bail, I was walking everywhere in Tokyo alone. I had no bodyguard. I went to restaurants, I went to movie, and people were greeting me. They were telling me, Gambate kudasai gonsa. They were saying, we're sorry about happening to you. We hope you continue to love Japan. This is the people on the street. Because the people on the street do not think one second that after celebrating this guy, this guy Jean, for 17 years, all of a sudden, he became a villain. They don't understand it, they don't believe it, they don't even understand the accusation. So, and when they say I don't love Japan, let's make some history, a little bit of history. I, I revived Nissan. I went back, uh, we crossed the financial crisis together. When the tsunami hit Japan, I was the first foreigner to come back to Japan, if you remember. I was the first one. 
because it happened that I was in France on an executive committee. I was the first foreigner to come back in Japan when everybody was leaving Japan. And I was the first one to dare going to Iwaki plant, which was near Fukushima. Because in Fukushima, if you remember, you had the nuclear leaks. And nobody dared to go to Iwaki because of the nuclear leaks. I had to go by myself and call the suppliers and call the employees to say, we're going to rebuild the plant together. I have my kids in Japan, educated in Japan. I lived in Japan. I refused to abandon Nissan only because I cared about the country and they cared about the company. So I'm asking one question. I'm not cold toward Japan. I love Japan. Why Japan is paying me with evil for the good I think I've done to the country? I don't understand that. I profoundly don't understand that. Because I know Japanese people are not like this. The second thing is they, they're greedy. They say, I'm greedy. I'm greedy. In, 19, in 2009, Steve Ratner, who was Obama car czar, General Motors was down, Chrysler was down. He came to me and said, I talked to the president. We want you to become the CEO of General Motors. He, wrote, he has written this in his book, so I'm not telling you stories. You can, you can look at the book. And he was offering me a pay which was double my pay. I said, you know what? I understand your offer is very attractive, but a captain of a ship doesn't leave the ship when the ship is in difficulty. This is not a greedy guy talking. A greedy guy would say, sorry guys, this is business. I'm going to go for my own interest. And frankly, I made a mistake. I recognize it today. I should have offered. I should have accepted the offer. But I have my beliefs, and I, offer, uh, and I followed my beliefs. Then, so this is about greedy. The third thing is about uh, dictator. Well, did I discover I'm a dictator in 2018? For 2007. For 17 years, I'm a CEO of the company. I had 20 books. You have so many professors coming. I have so many cases in Harvard, Stanford, INSEAD, HSA, Waseda, KU, all of them coming, all the professors analyzing this. Nobody, nobody discovered I was a dictator. All these people who have made the analysis, have made all the cases, nobody had a doubt that I was a dictator. This whole thing, which was very elegantly fabricated, imposed on the Japanese public. But you know what? The public did not react in function of what they said. Because I told you, I didn't have a bodyguard. I walked in Japan all the time by myself or one of my kids. We have never been bothered by anybody. We have always be been received very well in all the restaurants and the places that we have visited. But they tarnished my reputation in, any, and in many other countries where the fact that you have power or you're supposed to have money, you're already guilty. Well, it was not the same treatment, as you know. Yeah, a small break. I can continue, but maybe. We're just going to do a break for those who want um, OJ translations. We're going to provide. Uh, some audio translation, so please ask for it because Mr. Gunn will be answering questions asked in Arabic, in Arabic, questions in English, in English, and questions in French, in French. Thank you very much. And question in Portuguese, in Portuguese. Sure. <laughs> Ela é a fake Tony.
يعني من الواضح أن هذا المؤتمر استحوذ اهتمام جميع الحاضرين بدليل أن الهدوء كان سيد الموقف كان هناك استماع بتأن لكل التفاصيل التي عرضها كارلوس سيسون في هذا المؤتمر كما سبق وأسلفت حدث في نقاط أربعة تتعلق بالقضايا المرفوعة ضده أو الاتهامات المرفوعة ضده فيما يتعلق بشركة نيسان رونو إلى آخره الآن هناك استراحة بسيطة جدا لدقائق قليلة والسبب هو أن كارلوس غصن سيجيب على الأسئلة التي ستطرح عليه سيلفوبلي سيجيب على كل الأسئلة التي ستطرح عليه باللغة التي ستطرح عليه فيها أي أن الصحفيين اللبنانيين سيطرحون الأسئلة بالعربية الفرنسيين بالفرنسية بالإنجليزية وحتى الصحفيين البرازيليين سيطرحون الأسئلة بالبرتغالية وسيجيب بهذه اللغة التي يتقنها أيضا والسبب في ذلك هو أنهم يطلبون نعم واضح ان ان الصحفيين اليابانيين يتحدثون بطريقه لا تحمل الكثير من الرضا على ما يقوله هناك تململ لناحيه الصحفيين اليابانيين ليسوا راضين على الاطلاق لما يقوله كارلوس غصن خصوصا ان وزير وزير العدل ان ان لم اكن مخطئا صدر قبل قليل بيان يقول الوزير وزير العدل اليابانيين سيعقد مؤتمرا صحفيا عند منتصف هذه الليله بتوقيت بيروت عند الساعه 12 ونصف عند منتصف الليل سيرد فيها على كل على كل ما قدمه كارلوس غصن من مستندات وقال ان هناك المزيد من المستندات التي سيظهرها مع مرور الايام وواضح ان الصحفيين اليابانيين هادئون كما كانوا منذ اليوم الاول لا يتحدثون الى الصحفيين الاخرين يتمسكون بهدوئهم وايضا بموقف يدل على عدم الرضا كثيرا مما يتابعون ويغطون سيتابعون هذه المعطيات ايضا We shall begin, we shall start. صحيح. Okay for her. صحيح يعني المعلومات اللي كشفها كارلوس غصن عن اعتقال وعدم السماح له بلقاء زوجته عدم السماح له بالاستحمام اكثر من مرتين بالاسبوع وضعه في الانفراد في غرفه لا نافذه لها الخروج نصف ساعه يوميا ما عدا نهايه الاسبوع لان الحراسه تكون اقل في نهايه الاسبوع كل هذه العوامل التي تحدث بها حاولنا ان نرصد كيفيه تفاعل الصحفيين اليابانيين معها كانوا طبعا ردات الفعل كانت متاخره بانتظار الترجمه التي كانوا يستمعون من خلالها الى ما يحدث ولكن لم يكن هناك رضا على الاطلاق وكانوا في كل مره تظهر وثيقه جديده بخلاف بقيه الصحفيين الذين يعرفون اننا سنحصل على نسخ من هذه الوثائق كانوا يقومون بالتقاطها وارسالها عبر هواتفهم او حواسيبهم الى الى الاعلام لانهم كانوا مهتمين جدا بكل ما يتم نشره أس الصحفيين الفرنسيين طبعا بما اننا نتقن اللغه الفرنسيه يمكننا ان نفهم ما كانوا يقولون، كان الحديث نادر جدا ولكنهم كانوا يتابعون وكان اهتمامهم بارز عندما تحدث عن قضيه قصر فرساي، كان متهما بانه اقام حفل عيد ميلاده تحت الستار، حفل في قصر فرساي، عندما قدم كل المستندات كان هناك حماس لافت من الصحافه الفرنسيه لمتابعه هذه التفاصيل، بما ان الامر يعنيهم بدرجه اولى وهذا الامر له حساسيه في فرنسا وبعدما عرض كل الوثائق قاموا بالتقاط الصور أيضا وهم يترقبون ما سيكون الموقف الفرنسي بعد ذلك خصوصا أن هذه القضية مطروحة لدى الرأي العام الفرنسي بشكل لافت ولكن كارلوس غصن أكد أن ما حصل كان بعد دعم 
قصر فيرسايلي اعادة الترميم ولا يتم دفع اي مبلغ خارج الميزانيات من اجل الحفل سنعود على ما يبدو يطلبون منا الجلوس لمتابعه الاسئله والاجابات مع كارلوس غصن اتابع الانتظار معك توني بانتظار ان تبدا هذه الاسئله والاجابات لان الصحفيين يترقبون هذا المقطع ويبدو ان كارلوس غصن سيخصص وقتا للاسئله والاجوبه كثيرون يعتقدون ان ما قاله هو الدفاع الذي قام به عن نفسه ولكن الان سيتم طرح العديد من الاسئله عن هروبه العديد من الاسئله عن المرحله المقبله عن عن وضعه في لبنان إلى آخره الصحفيون يتجهون الآن إلى أماكنهم وسيتم طرح الأسئلة اتباعا من الصحفيين كل بلغته على أي حال من أجل أن يتمكنوا من طرح ما يريد ننتظر نرفع أيدينا وننتظر التنظيم لكي يعطي الميكروفون لل للصحفيين يبدو انهم يطلبون منا الهدوء وسيبدا بدا كارلوس الكلام Good morning, Mr. Hassan. John Akhul, MTV. In Arabic. Yeah, you can choose the language you want. Okay. Second, Ayah. Uh, أولا بالنسبة. Ah, you want me to the podium? No, no. I, I try to be as much as possible. It's okay for you. I will do it. It's okay. That's fine. رح نحترم بس الرغبة إنه ما نوقف بسبب الكاميرايات. السؤال الأول يتعلق بظروف الهروب. حددت إنه ما بدك تحكي بالتفاصيل ولكن هناك العديد من الروايات التي تحدث فيها الإعلام. هل رح تكشف تفاصيل هالهروب؟ وهل صحيح أنك وقعت عقد مع نتفليكس واتفقت مع أحد المنتجين لتصويره على بطريقة فيلم؟ والسؤال الثاني عن المرحلة المقبلة بلبنان هل هناك حديث عن إمكانية توليك منصب رسمي أو مساعدة لبنان اقتصاديا وسياسيا؟ مسيو غسون ثاني سؤال مارلان خليفة هل بتعتقد هل هل وضعت استراتيجية دفاعية لإلك وهل بتعتقد إنه دفاعك عن نفسك من لبنان بقوي موقفك أو بضعفه؟ أوكي. راح راح جيو بالعربي إذا بتسألني سؤال بالعربي بجيو بالعربي. أولاً ما في كونترا مع نتفليكس في كتير أساطير بالجرايد في كتير أساطير في فوق اللي سبلاني لا طيب في كتير أس في كتير أساطير بالجرايد. بدنا ننتبه عليها ما في كونتراكت ما في كونتراكت مع نتفليكس ثانيا انا مش رح احكي عن كيف ظهرت من اليابان لانه مثل ما بتعرف رح اعرض كذا شخص الى مشاكل مهمه يعني ما بقدر كمان الناس اللي ساعدوني ابرم ظهري طالما انا برات اليابان ما بقدر لازم احترم احترمهم مش هيك ما عم بحكي مش مش انه ما عم بحكي لانه عم خفي شيء ما بحكي لانه بدي دافع عن الناس اللي ساعدوني وما في كونتراكت مع نتفليكس هلا اذا شي يوم من الايام رح تعرفوا الحقيقه انتم انتم رح تقولوا الحقيقه مش مش ناطريني يعني انتم عم تعملوا الانكيت وانتم عم تعرفوا شو عم بيصير وانتم رح توصلوا على الحقيقه بلا ما انا احكي هلا معقول انا يوم يوم من الايام بعد 20 سنه اقول لكم مزبوط اما غلط بس مش رح احكي عن كيف ظهرت من اليابان 
Allemand, okay. peut-être toi, la main. Monsieur Rosson, Monsieur Rosson, c'est avec moi. Monsieur Rosson. Là, ça, Monsieur Rosson. Monsieur Rosson. Monsieur Rosson, mais qui est au oui, Monsieur Gaun, bonjour, Gaëtan Mélin, BFM TV. Je voulais savoir, tous ces documents que vous nous avez présentés, est-ce que vous êtes en mesure de nous les fournir pour ensuite pouvoir les examiner et montrer que ces documents sont la preuve de ce que vous avancez, à savoir que ces montages financiers n'existent pas je suis prêt à vous remettre tous les documents que je vous ai montrés. Il y en a d'autres que je ne vous ai pas montrés. Je vais montrer un spécimen de ce que nous avons reçu. Je peux vous dire qu'il y a plein d'autres documents sur lesquels maintenant qu'on va pouvoir retirer. Parce que vous savez, avant, j'étais en prison, j'étais au Japon, je ne pouvais pas parler. Donc il y a beaucoup de gens qui se taisaient. Maintenant, il y a beaucoup de gens qui vont parler. Et là, vous allez voir apparaître tout d'un coup des tas de documents qui vont aller dans ce sens-là. Moi, ce que je vous demande, ce que je demande, c'est que... Euh, mes avocats, et particulièrement Maître Aboujaoudi qui est présent, qui, qui me représente au, au, au Liban, et qui fait partie de l'équipe de défense mondiale, euh, vous pouvez le, le joindre, il mettra à votre disposition les documents qui vont expliquer tout ce que je vous ai dit. Voilà. Monsieur Rossel, Monsieur Rossel, Monsieur لبنان اليوم عم بيعيش أكبر أزمة بتاريخه اقتصادية أنت بتقدر تعطي لبنان من خبرتك لحتى ينجح ويخلص أنا أنا شكرا. أنا ماني رجل سياسي أنا ماني رجل سياسي ولا عندي أي طموح سياسي بس بدي أتعلم بس إذا مين ما كان طلب مني أنه أنا حط خبرتي تأخدم البلد أنا مستعد إذا طلب مني تحط خدمتي بس مش كسياسة مش ما بدي وظيفة ما بدي رتبة ما بدي شيء منه بس إذا إذا مثلا حدا بالحكم إجا طلب رأيي أما طلب أقدر ساعي هالشخص لحتى حسن وضع البلد أنا كل خبرتي بحطها تحت تصرف لبنان مسيو غسن مسيو غسن إلت إلت لا لا سكيسا موناليزا نهار قلت ان قلت بال قلت بكلامك انه اليابان حسيت انه الشغل الوحيد اللي تخلص او الطريقة الوحيدة اللي تخلص نيسان من نفوز رينو هي انه تتخلص من كارلوس خصن شو كان موقف الحكومة الفرنسية يعني كيف تعتبر تعامل الحكومة الفرنسية مع محنتك بإبان توقيفك باليابان الحكومة الفرنسية عم بتقول إنه هي عم بتجرب تحسن العلاقات مع اليابانيين. مشان هيك ما عم تعمل أي خطوة تحط تبين إنه عم تتحدى اليابانيين. أوكي؟ هيدا الموقف الحكومة الفرنسية مثل ما بفهم. لا 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 لا. أوكي. so Brazil Brazil the Brazil Roberto Roberto tem muitos amigos no Brasil, Sim. foi presidente da Michelin lá, é amigo do ministro Paulo Guedes, Sim. a sua mãe mora no Brasil, suas irmãs moram no Brasil. Eu lhe pergunto, o governo brasileiro lhe tratou bem? Eu soube que o presidente Bolsonaro ligou para sua irmã. E a embaixada brasileira no Brasil, como foi o tratamento? Olha, os, os brasileiros, o consul, o consul uh, do Brasil no Japão foi muito amigo, muito querido. Ele realmente cuidou de mim durante o período que foi muito difícil para mim. Uh, você conhece ele, João Mendonça, uh, com a família dele, ele tratou com muito carinho. Uh, agora, você sabe porque o presidente Bolsonaro faz um anúncio no jornal, uh, onde alguém fez uma pergunta para ele uh, se ele está pronto para falar, no meu caso, com as autoridades japonesas. And, and se eu me lembro, ele falou que ele não quis fazer isso para não atropelar, atrapalhar uh, as autoridades japonesas. Bom, claro que eu não, não gosto desse tipo de, de, de declaração. Agora, eu respeito esse tipo de declaração, mas uh, eu estava esperando um pouco mais ajuda da parte do governo brasileiro. Uh, que não aconteceu, infelizmente.
Bon, bah, euh, euh, attendez, oui. Euh, Est-ce qu'on peut avoir une autre région Alors, on a France, Liban. Can, can we have the US The US What is the US <laughs> Okay, US is here. Mr. Go. Please, US, US, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. So, Nick Kostov. Um, Nick Kostov from the Wall Street Journal. Yes. Um, I'm curious as to what your plan is uh, now, because it seems to me it's going to be difficult to find a legal forum in which to clear your name. So how do you feel about the prospect of living out, you know, the rest of your life as an international fugitive? Wow. Is that the price to pay for getting out of Japan? Is, yeah. is it worth it? Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, first, I am used to what you call Mission Impossible. I've been into many Mission Impossible. When I went in Japan in 1999, everybody told me, you know, it's impossible. You're not going to be able to make it. Who are you? You don't speak Japanese. You're coming from France. You're coming from Renault. Nobody knows that. And you know the story. I don't consider that now I'm in a situation where I cannot do anything. I can do a lot. And I'm going to clear my name. And I'm going to find the ways to make sure that the truth is going to come back. So today, yes, on the short term, I'm here. And by the way, I'm proud to be here because I'm surrounded by friends in Lebanon. I'm surrounded by people who respect me and who are proud of me, which really I needed after the ordeal I've been through. But I'm not going to just, you know, uh, say, okay, that's it. I'm not going to do anything else. So you can expect me in the next weeks to take some initiative to tell you how I'm going to clear my name, what kind of forum I'm going to be used to make sure that all the evidence are going to come to the table and that everything I've done be restored and everything which happened be put not into a propaganda system where I appeal as the cold, greedy dictator, but for why I have been is somebody who has been a very important actor in the car, uh, in the car industry with everything I've done. My yeah, friend. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Ross. No, 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 please. OK. Uh, CNN, yes, please. BBC. Uh, Carlos, go and request CNN. Um, following on from my colleague's question, it, some, it might seem to some that you've substituted a very small cell in Japan for a much larger one here in Lebanon, where you can't go anywhere, you can't leave the country, uh, you and your wife are both at risk. Would you go to France? Would you even risk getting on a plane to go to France, even though the minister there has said you would not be extradited? Yeah. Well, uh, as you know, um, there is a red notice uh, that the Japanese government has sent through Interpol. Uh, my lawyers say we can fight the red notice, and particularly we can eliminate the red notice if we can explain our case, particularly if it's considered as a political case. They are more competent than me to tell you what's going to happen. But obviously, first, I don't consider myself as a prisoner in Lebanon. I'm very happy to be here, I can tell you. And I prefer this prison to the one where I was before, as you can imagine. Uh, and particularly here, I'm with my friends, I'm with my family, my kids can come visit me, I can use the phone, I can use internet, I don't have followers, or the only followers I have, by the way, I didn't talk to you about the followers, I will probably, the only followers I have are people who want to talk to me or who want, who want something much nicer than I've been. So, uh, frankly, I don't feel at all unhappy in Lebanon. I'm ready to stay a long time in Lebanon, but please do not consider that I'm just accept this as it is. I'm going to fight because I have to clear my name, and this is something which is extremely important to me. I can't accept the fact that fabricating a story and lying about something at such a scale can win or can prevail. I can't accept it, particularly that this is my story. Mr. Gohn from the BBC. OK, uh, we... uh, okay no, just one second. Yes, lady, lady near, yeah, near Richard. Near What's Richard. the point of having this? Yeah, can you give? Well, can you give him a microphone, please? Is this the microphone? Yes, yes. I'm coming back to you. This is no. Looking please, for the mic. go ahead. The question is, hi, Michelle Caruso Cabrera, CNBC. You said that you want Nissan to have autonomy, but autonomy needs to be earned. Yeah. 
It sounds like it's contradictory to me. Did you ever propose a merger, a full-on merger between Nissan and Renault? I didn't. I proposed a holding company where you have one share for the lines. That means there is no more Renault share, Nissan share. There is one share, which is an aligned share. But you have a Nissan operation based in Japan. You have a Renault operation based in France. You keep the headquarter, but you have only one board. So you will have different headquarters, different brand, different executive committee, one board, one share. That's what I was proposing. So it was not a full merger. Because in a full merger, you have one headquarter, you have one board, you have one executive committee, which was not the case. So I was trying as much as possible to overcome the resistance coming from the Japanese to wanting to be very autonomous. And at the same time, from the other side, the willingness of the French to go for a full merger. So I thought that the holding company, the way I was presenting, was a very good balance be between the wish of a full merger from one side and the desire for autonomy. But as you know, at the end of the day, one side said, why do we need all of this? OK, let's get rid of him. And that's what happened. Because today, there is nothing. There is no holding. They're not even in lines. We went backward. We didn't go forward. We went backward. BBC. Uh, Mr. Gohan, John Simpson from the BBC. Uh, two questions, if I may. Um, you say, and it's understandable, you don't want to cause a fuss between Lebanon and Japan. But it's clear that you say there's been a conspiracy. How high up in the Japanese system does that conspiracy go? Does it go up? perhaps to the very top, would you, would you believe? Secondly, would you be prepared to stand trial in Lebanon for on the charges that, you've been, you've, that have been leveled against you? OK, so on the first question, I mean, if you were not saying that you were from the BBC, from the two questions you asked, I would have guessed. You know? So for the first question, for the first question uh, you said, uh, I don't think, I don't personally think that the top level was involved. If this is your question. I don't think, if you're talking about Abisan, I don't think Abisan was involved. But how high But, you know, again, I, I need to respect my own word to avoid any friction between the two countries. And I think this is my duty to make sure that, uh, you know, we don't create more tension than what, what may happen. So, so we're going to stop it. Now, the second question was about... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I would be ready to stand trial anywhere where I think I can have a fair trial. Anywhere. But the only reason for which, if, 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 if I was, if somebody could guarantee to me, which was not the case of my lawyers, when I asked my lawyers many times, and they will tell you that in Japan, will I have a fair trial? They were very embarrassed. They told me, we're going to do everything for you to have a fair trial. And they kept saying this to me, which worried me a lot. Because if my lawyer cannot even tell me, you're going to have a fair trial, I think Hironaka-san in his statement, or Takashi-san in his statement, they said, you know, even though he doesn't have a fair trial, we think he will be acquitted. Because, Mr. Of, the, be, because of the strengths of the argument they have in hands. But when you are in a position, you're not in your country, you don't speak the language, they, people tell you you 99.4% conviction rate. Uh, estimate is all of this because you have the first trial, the appeal, and then eventually Supreme Court. Then the second trial, the appeal, Supreme Court. Five years. Five years. Estimate. No guarantee. Five years of trial. After this, a 99.4% of conviction rate. Oh, my God. That means I was seeing myself saying practically all my life in Japan. By the way, deprived from my wife because there was absolutely no sign they were going to release a ban from my wife. When I went, I, mean, I was not an expert of the Japanese system. When I went on bail, my lawyers told me, usually after two months, three months, if you respect all the conditions of the bail, which I did, they start to soften a little bit. You can start to use your phone. You can use your, you, you can use your uh, email at home. Maybe you can see your wife. That's what they told me. Nine months later, nothing was softened. Not one thing was softened. I was asking for the phone, for nothing at all. The judge kept saying, we're going to keep the same thing. And then what they told me is, we, you may not see your wife before the second trial starts. So my prospect was, I couldn't see Carol. I couldn't talk to Carol for another one year and a half. For what? 
tampering evidence. But I have plenty of people visiting me. I could tamper evidence with anybody, with anybody. And by the way, I left Japan, even though I have followers behind me, camera in the house, no telephone, etc. So if I was intending to do something, I would have done it anyway. So this was persecution. This was persecution. It was obvious. And because I felt this persecution and no hope, and you have this bombarding of the villain, unfortunately supported outside, supported outside, I decided to take the risk because, because I wanted justice. And now, and now, I can tell you, the first forum where I can express myself in front of a justice like which is not biased, I'll go for it. Mr. Gohn, no. Christophe Jacobizine. Mr. Rosson. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Guys, we are losing a lot of time. We are losing a lot of time. We're losing a lot of time. Okay. Let, now, question, question. Japan. No. You see, Japan. Uh, Ma'am, I, I don't think, I don't know if it's easier or more difficult or anything else. Why you choose Lebanon? Well, I choose Lebanon because I'm Lebanese. I'm Lebanese. I could and have chosen. I, yeah, I, I'm Brazilian also. I could have chosen a, a, a Brazil. Okay, okay. I can choose France. But I choose Lebanon for considerations which are more logistical than anything else. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay, let's Mr. go here. Yeah. Yeah, please go Sorry ahead. Sorry, from Reuters. Can I, can I go ahead, Sami Anakul from Reuters? I just want to ask you, the Japanese prosecutors are still saying and pushing for you to be extradited. Do you have assurances from the Lebanese president and government that you won't be extradited and you're safe in Lebanon? Uh, no, I have no assurance of anybody, uh, I, but I think there are precedent and there are laws, and I trust, I, I trust that the laws existing in Lebanon will be implemented. I have no reason to doubt, uh, to doubt that. So here I am confident that uh, you know the existing practices and uh, the laws will be respected in Lebanon and I think this is what I heard from all the officials in Lebanon so now Japan question to Japan Japanese question please go ahead you have the mic you have the mic is TV Tokyo TV Tokyo is TV Tokyo TV Tokyo TV Tokyo yeah TV Tokyo Speaking English. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, well, if not, you're not going to have an answer. <laughs> okay. um, you were a respect, respected CEO in Japan, but you broke Japanese law to be here. Isn't it wrong? Um, please let the Japanese people know you are sold. My, my what? Um, broke. Ah, my thought, my thought, my thought. Yeah, okay. your sword. Yeah. yeah. I will. Yeah, to Japanese people. Uh, yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, obviously, uh, you know, again, let, let's go back to your question. Uh, as you said, I was, and I still think I am, for at least part of the population, a respected businessman in, uh, in, in Japan. And I remember I had many meetings with the press and the press even, which is not very favorable to me, who told me nobody contests the fact that you have revived Nissan, nobody contests the fact you have done good things in Japan because all the other CEOs were following some of the practices that you introduced in 1999, <laughs> etc. Nobody contests that, okay? But you need to defend these charges, okay? You have charges against you, you need to defend them, which is exactly what I want to do. But how can I defend myself if I am denied justice? If I'm denied the tool to defend myself, how can I defend myself? Yeah, I mean, obviously, breaking the law in Japan because I got out of Japan is a problem. But don't you think it's a problem that the prosecutor broke 10 laws in Japan following my, and nobody cares? Nobody cares. I mean, they broke the law. I mean, you know very well that there is a law in Japan saying the prosecutor cannot leak. You know that, OK? You know that. But you know they leak. Everybody tells you they leak. All the journalists come tell me, you know, we heard this from the prosecutor. Okay, they're breaking the law, but nobody cares. So why me breaking the law is a problem when the prosecutor breaking 10 laws is not a problem and nobody cares? So at a certain point in time, when you are in a situation where you only guy you have to respect the law and everybody else doesn't respect the law and nobody cares, you say it's a rigged system. 
It's a rigged system. And I don't think, and frankly, I don't think Japan deserves that. I don't think Japanese people are like that. As I told you, I like Japan. I like Japanese people. I spent 17 years. I don't regret it. I don't regret it. I'm telling you. What I regret is specific nomination I've done inside the company because at the end of the day, I was damn wrong on the people. That I regret that. But the Japanese people have been good to me. And my intention is not to hurt Japan or to hurt the Japanese people. But, but why, 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 why am I being paid with the evil? Why? What did I do? Why I've been treat, I've treat, treated like a terrorist in Japan, like somebody who's going to hurt other people? What did I do to deserve this treatment? That's what I don't understand. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, I, Second yes. question for Japan and then we'll yes. Please go ahead. Yes, I am from a Japanese uh, publishing company, Shogakkan and the News uh, Weekly Post, News Post Seven. Yes, and I was uh, firstly very surprised that there were so few Japanese media here and you didn't let Japanese other Japanese uh, media in. And uh, why you selected like that? Or you have uh, some uh, kind of uh, uh, anger against Japanese media? Or uh, the, another thing is that how we don't have any information about how you were treated in, in, in prison. And could you tell us a little bit yeah. detail? Let, yeah, no, no look, uh, I am not segregating against Japanese media. I know that a lot of colleagues are down uh, outside, but frankly, if you've been selected, in my opinion, it was the only people who tried to be objective into the situation, and all the other people were being sourced at the Christian. prosecutors. Okay? So, frankly, introducing people who are uh, a relay for the prosecutive propaganda is not any advantage for me. I want to talk with people who can analyze the facts and who can talk about the facts. But it doesn't mean I'm running from them. I can tell you, when we finish, I'm going to go see them and tell them hello, and they have, I have nothing against you. But I wanted here in the room the BBC, the CNN, the CBS, the Al Nahar, the, the, the LBC, uh, etc., uh, the Globo, because these are people who are big media and they're going to be very objective in front of the case. They're not going to be sweet to me, but they're going to be factual. While, you know, most of their colleagues, for 14 months, they have been telling everything Nissan and the prosecutors are saying. Every single thing, without any single sense of analysis, without any single sense. Of, uh, of criticism. That's why I think, you know, unfortunately this is a room, it's already full. If I add all the Japanese media here, it would not have been possible. But, but I'm not running from them. Uh, and I'm counting on you to carry the message. Monsieur Gono, Christophe, Christophe Jacubizi de BFM Business, vous nous avez dit qu'il y avait deux raisons pour que toute affaire commence. Ouais. La première, c'était les performances moins, moins bonnes de, de Nissan. La deuxième, c'est le droit de vote double instauré par l'État français en 2015. Est-ce est que vous tenez responsable, le ministre de l'économie de l'époque, de l'avoir institué Je rappelle qu'il s'appelait à l'époque Emmanuel Macron. Oui. Non, euh, je, 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 je suis navré, mais vous avez mal compris ce que je voulais dire. Le premier élément, ce que j'ai dit, bien sûr, c'est le déclin de la performance de Nissan, dont Sakawa est responsable. Sakawa a commencé à dire « Ah, c'est hérité d'une situation, euh, Monsieur Gaulle, etc. » La performance au bout de trois ans n'est plus de la responsabilité de la personne qui a précédé, elle est de votre responsabilité. Puis je trouve lamentable, quand quelqu'un prend la direction générale d'un groupe, il doit assumer le groupe. C'est fini. C'est lui qui est en charge. Moi, quand je suis arrivé en 99, je n'ai pas dit tous les cons qui étaient avec moi n'ont pas fait leur boulot. Je n'ai rien dit. J'ai dit voilà la situation de l'entreprise et on va aller à partir de ce, de, de ce moment-là. Et c'est pourquoi les gens m'ont respecté. Parce que je n'ai pas critiqué mes prédécesseurs. Je n'ai pas utilisé des moyens parce qu'ils ne pouvaient plus se prononcer compte tenu de la situation lamentable dans laquelle j'ai trouvé Nissan. Je ne l'ai pas fait. Par contre, hériter d'une situation florissante avec un groupe remonté et aller m'accuser de dire tous les problèmes que lui, dont lui est responsable, ça je trouve ça lamentable. Ça c'est le premier point. Le deuxième point, je n'ai pas dit que c'était la loi Florence qui avait occasionné tout ça. J'ai dit que la méfiance créée au Japon par deux choses. D'un côté, la loi Florence. Ce n'est pas la loi Florence parce qu'on aurait pu très bien accepter la loi Florence et donner le droit de vote aux Japonais. Il n'y aurait pas de problème. Mais le fait que, un, on a voté la loi Florence et deux, on a refusé, on a refusé par, par, par la pression de l'État, bien sûr, de donner le droit de vote à Nissan, c'est ça qui a provoqué la méfiance de nos amis japonais. Ça, c'est le, le premier point. Mais deuxièmement, quand effectivement mon mandat est venu en question, il y a eu des tas de déclarations de tous les gens qui veulent s'occuper de Renault, euh, et qui ne sont pas dans Renault d'ailleurs, et qui veulent s'occuper de Renault, nous faisons la stratégie de l'entreprise, nous allons nous préoccuper de ceci ou de cela. Bon, ça fait peur. 
ça fait peur quand vous avez des gens qui ne sont pas compétents, qui commencent à dire « nous allons faire la stratégie de l'entreprise, nous allons faire telle et telle décision », ça fait très peur. Parce que ce sont des gens, finalement, qui prennent des décisions dont ils ne sont pas responsables, sur le fond. Le gars qui doit rendre des comptes sur les résultats de Renault, c'est le patron de Renault, c'est personne d'autre. Donc, quand je dis que le, 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 le point, le point n'est pas la loi Florange, c'est le fait qu'on a refusé euh, aux Japonais un droit de vote, ce qui a créé un doute. Et deuxièmement, le fait qu'on a dit qu'il faut à tout prix, euh, M. Ghosn a la responsabilité de créer une alliance irréversible, ce que j'ai accepté. Sauf que irréversible, ça voulait dire des tas de choses pour des tas de gens. Et pour beaucoup de Japonais, irréversible, ça faisait une fusion, ce qui n'était pas du tout mon intention. Moi, j'ai dit, si vous voulez une fusion, c'est quelqu'un d'autre qui va la faire, ce n'est pas moi. Moi, je n'y crois pas. Je pense qu'une fusion est impossible à manager, et je l'avais dit très clairement. Donc, tout le monde avait accepté que c'était plutôt quelque chose dans lequel on allait vers une irréversibilité, tout en respectant l'autonomie des entreprises. Voilà. Donc, euh, pour que l'on soit très clair. Maroun Nassif, LBC International. Faura Wassoulik El Alubnan, Bada Ayem, Tarada Dit Malumet, Anna Carlos Rossan, El Takara, Isil Jumhuri, Watalaka Dam, El Kamel Menno, Hal Hassal, El Lika Hakan, Wa Maza Tarud, Ala, El Akbar, La De Kodem, Be Anna Carlos Rossan, Sabaka Anzara, Israel, Wal Takata Sora, and Mamasulin, Israelien, Wal Ubnan Yatabar, Israel, Dauli Adoui, Hunak Akbar, Amam El Kada, Behad Al Moudoua. Awalan, Awalan. أنا أنا ما علي يفسر أنا إذا بدك تعرف إذا أنا تلقيت بحياة الله الشخصية اللبنانية بدك تسأل الشخصية اللبنانية أنا مش أحكي عن هذه الاجتماعات أنا عندي كثير اجتماعات بس مش مش أنا اللي أحكي عن الاجتماعات اللي صاروا معي هذا أولا ثانيا ثانيا عم تحكي عن عن سفرتي على إسرائيل أنا ما سافرت على إسرائيل كمواطن لبناني أنا بس رحت على إسرائيل رحت كمدير عام رونو على طلب إدارة عامة رونو ورحت كفرنساوي ورحت بمحل كونترا بين رونو وشركة إسرائيلية مدعومة من من الدولة الإسرائيلية مش نبيع عربيات على الكهرباء ونجبرت روح لأنه مجلس الإدارة طلب مني أنه روح لأنه بيعتبرني أنا فرنساوي ومدير شركة فرنساوية وإذا أنا ما بدي أعملها تفضل تنزل عن عن مشهد هذه هي مش أنه رحت ساوير أما أحكي رحت مديد كونترا ورجعت كمدير عام رونو بعربيات على الكهرباء وأنا ما مخبى فيها أنا حكيت عنها ورجعت وحكيت مع المسؤولين اللبنانيين ومثل ما بتعرف من سنة الألفين وكذا عم برجع على لبنان كل مرة وما صار في شيء ما بعرف هلأ كيف صار أنه هلأ عم يرجعوا يرفعوا أنه شو هالمساقبة يعني كيف كيف ساقبة أنه هيدي ضلت مضمومة وليه هلأ عم ترجع مين عنده مصلحة هلأ يرجع يحرك بهالأشياء بها Monsieur Goun, Marie de Greff, Valeurs Actuelles. Non, Valeurs Actuelles, Marie de Greff, la France. Madame, je vous rassure. Je n'ai pas le droit, je n'ai pas, je n'ai absolument pas l'intention d'abandonner mes droits. J'ai des droits vis-à-vis -vis de Nissan, j'ai des droits vis-à-vis -vis de Renault qui n'ont pas été respectés et je compte bien les réclamer en justice. Parce que je crois dans la justice française et je crois d'une certaine manière aussi, du point sur le plan civil, à la justice japonaise. Donc, non, hein? please, please, please. Non, the cameraman are not happy. RT France. So, donc, donc. Donc, donc, RT, voilà RT France, que Monsieur Gunn, yes, RT France, euh, cette question, puisque euh, cette affaire, elle semble Madame, avoir... Madame, vous êtes de quelle, cette affaire, quelle chaîne RT France. RT France. Voilà. Cette affaire, elle semble avoir mis en, en lumière euh, des failles présumées au sein de, de la justice euh, nippone. En tout cas, ça pose beaucoup d'interrogations. Euh, malgré cela, euh, la France euh, semble être restée quand même assez silencieuse. Oui. Euh, Monsieur Gunn, euh, est-ce que vous vous êtes senti lâché par euh, les autorités françaises et selon vous, pourquoi Écoutez, euh, vous auriez été à ma place, vous vous seriez senti comment, madame Très simple question. Vous auriez été, au travers de ce que j'ai été, vous vous auriez senti comment Soutenu Défendu Lâché Neutre Je ne sais pas. Je ne sais pas. Moi, je ne me prononce pas pour l'instant. J'espère, j'espère, que ce n'est pas le cas, c'est ce que j'espère. Parce que quand même, je suis un citoyen français, alors on me dit comme les autres, 
mais pas au-dessous au au des autres. Je ne demande pas à être au-dessus de qui que ce soit, mais je ne souhaite pas être en dessous de qui que ce soit. Euh, je voulais juste vous demander, euh, du coup, c'est ce que vous allez faire, vous allez attaquer Renault et Nissan devant la justice française, c'est ce que vous avez prévu de faire Je n'ai pas attaqué qui que ce soit, j'ai dit que j'allais défendre mes droits et qu'il n'était pas l'intention de m'asseoir sur, euh, sur mes droits. J'ai des droits. On a dit que finalement, okay. en janvier, j'avais démissionné de Renault, ce qui est faux. Hein la lettre que j'ai envoyée au syndicat à lire, elle n'a pas été d'ailleurs distribuée aux membres du conseil d'administration. Elle a été lue aux membres du conseil d'administration en ville. Je n'ai pas démissionné de Renault. Donc ça, c'est une forfaiture de dire que j'ai démissionné de Renault. J ai, j ai, je, me suis, je me suis retiré pour permettre à Renault de fonctionner normalement alors que j'étais en prison. Et dire que ça, c'est une démission, c'est quand même un travestissement de la réalité. Or, j'ai demandé à partir à la retraite et je défendrai mes droits en tant que personne qui a travaillé autant d'années, qui a rendu autant de services et qui a droit à une retraite. Je, je ne vais euh... pas vous dire ce que je vais faire. Ce que je vous dis, je vais okay. défendre mes droits. Oui. OK. Euh, attendez, 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 attendez. Radouan Murtada, Majerit Lakhbar. Alors, attendez. Yeah. Uh, can I ask one question? Is there any citizenship that did not talk... Radouan Murtada, Majerit Lakhbar. Jarid Lakhbar? Jarid Lakhbar. يعطيك العافية والحمد لله على السلامة. في سؤال هو استكمال للسؤال اللي سأله زميلي حول زيارة إسرائيل. أنت قلت إنه رحت كنت ممثل لشركة، لكن إنك أنت رحت بال2008 يعني بعد سنتين على حرب تموز. يعني كانت أيدي المسؤولين الإسرائيليين اللي أنت صفحتها ما كانت جفت من دم اللبنانيين اللي ماتوا. أنت حكيت عن معاناة، حكيت عن ظلم تعرضت له باليابان. انحرمت من مرتك كارول لسنة ونص في كتير من الأسرة موجودين عند هذا العدو سؤالي أنا ولو أنك أنت رحت كممثل لشركة هل تعتذر للبنانيين على هذه الزيارة وهل تعتبر إسرائيل عدو هل تعتبر شو يعني هل تعتبر إسرائيل عدو وهل تعتذر أنا أنا معلوم بعتذر بالزيارة وأنا كنت كتير مأثر بس شفت إنه قسم الشعب اللبناني تأثر فيها لأنه آخر شغلة كان بدي أعملها إنه إدار الشعب اللبناني هاي دي آخر شغلة عملتها سيد بوكلي مسيو مسيو اسكيليا دو وي هاف أني أني جروب يا يا سبيس جو هيد جود أفترنون فرانشيسكا كافيري فروم لا ريبوبليكا La Repubblica, Italy. You were mentioning the possible alliance between Breno and FCA. Can you go through there? Was it a missing chance? And then if you can please share some of deta the details of your trip here to Lebanon. I know you said you don't want to talk about it, but just a little bit. But let's start with <laughs> Renault FCA, please. Uh, this is a very Italian question. <laughs> a little bit, just a little bit. No. Um, um, I, I, I had contact with, uh, with uh, FCA. Uh, I, uh, we had a, a lot of understanding. We had a very good uh, dialogue. Uh, unfortunately, I was arrested uh, before we could come to a conclusion. Uh, but the conclusion was not very far. Uh, I had a planned meeting in January for a, a kind of final conclusion of the deal. In January, I was in the detention center of Kosuge, and as you know, uh, this deal went on, but unfortunately, did not happen to Renault. And I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a big waste for Renault. It's a big. I, I think it's a great opportunity for PSA, but it's a great waste for Renault. That's what I'm saying. Maris Burgo pour uh, France okay. Télévision. France Télévision. Oui. Monsieur Gaun, vous avez dit vous-même que vous avez pris un grand risque en. en en quittant euh, le Japon. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire quels sentiments vous avez eu euh, au moment où vous avez, euh, vous avez réussi à quitter euh, le Japon Certains médias ont fait état d'une malle dans laquelle vous auriez été caché. Quels sentiments avez-vous eu au moment où vous avez tenté cette opération qui était extrêmement dangereuse pour vous Comment vous êtes-vous senti Écoutez... Moi, quelque part, le 19 novembre 2018, j'ai senti, c'est comme si j'étais décédé. Je vivais chaque jour en disant, finalement, j'ai une vie tout à fait réduite. 
Mais euh, je ne sais pas si j'allais revoir les gens que j'aime. C'est plongé dans un système que je ne comprenais pas. C'est comme si j'étais mort. Vous savez, quand vous passez par une période comme ça, vous, vous, vous êtes paralysé, vous êtes, euh, euh, je ne dirais pas hypnotisé, c'est vous êtes euh, dambe, euh, nambe, euh, non, anesthésié, voilà. Vous, êtes anesthésié, vous vous anesthésiez parce que vous, n'avez pas, vous vous protégez contre la souffrance. Vous vous anesthésiez. Donc vous anesthésiez, vous ne supportez plus la musique, vous ne supportez, des, vous supportez plus les souvenirs, vous ne supportez, supportez plus les photos, parce que quelque part, vous ne voulez pas revenir en arrière, c'est votre façon de survivre cette période. Quand j'ai vu que j'étais sorti, c'est comme si, quelque part, je revenais à la vie. C'est... انا ما بعرف جاوب على السؤال يعني كله كله سبيكوليشن كله سبيكوليشن ما بدي جاوب انا عم لك انا جيت على لبنان ماني خايف من ال من الجاستس ماني خايف من الجاستس انا جاي على لبنان لانه بلبنان وما بقدر بحكي بقدر تلفن بقدر شوف الناس اللي حوالي انا كنت بوضع ممنوع من كل شيء يعني قاعد ببلد غريب ما بحكي اللغه ما بعرف حدا مقطوع من كل شيء ملاحق يعني هذه ما ما خبرتها بس كانوا يلاحقوني كل يوم من وقت ما طلعت من الحبس. ما بفكر يعني يعني ان شاء الله لا بس عم بقول انه مستر حسن حسن كارمن جلوبو او جلوبو كارمن لاباكي او جلوبو كومو كومو او كوانتو اليزي كومو او كوانتو او انتربول بودي انترفير نو سيو كازو كومو او كوانتو او انتربول بودي انترفير نو سيو كازو اوليا ايو نو سو especialista desse tipo de coisas, mas mais, meus advogados, o que eles falam é que a Interpol não tem nenhuma jurisdição dentro do Líbano, o que tem jurisdição dentro do Líbano é o governo libanês. Agora, se você atravessa a, a, as, fronteiras, as, as fronteiras libanesas e você vai para um país que tem um acordo com a Interpol, aqui, lá você tem um problema. Então, o único jeito de resolver, de resolver o problema e de ir para a Interpol, defender o teu caso, para eles remover o, uh, o cartão vermelho. Essa é a única coisa. Mr. Gowan, thank you. Uh, Mr. Gowan, Jonathan Rugman from Channel 4 News in the UK. Um, you must be worried. You must be worried that this affair is going to haunt you for the rest of your life, because people will say... If a guy is prepared to escape from Japan in a box, well, there's no smoke without fire. What do you say to that? <laughs> well, um, you know, there have been many stories about how I escaped with who I escaped, and we heard a lot of things which are contradictory, which obviously I'm not going to come back to it. Um, you know, you're going to have al- always a lot of people who tell you there is no smoke without fire, okay? which is fair, which always give the advantage to anybody who attacks you. If I'm going to go and tell a lot of stories about you, and they are not true, and you have a lot of people around you say, oh, there is no smoke without fire, so no matter how much lies I put, some of them are going to stick to you. This is the advantage of who is on the offensive. And in this case, that's what's happening. I was an easy target. Why? Because I was renowned. I was a foreigner. So it was very easy to say, this guy has overcome all the limits. He has hidden compensation he didn't receive. He has asked for this, etc. It's very easy. It's very easy to do it. Yes, it's true. You're right. A lot of people are going to say, he escaped because he's guilty. But I'm telling you, I didn't escape because I'm guilty. I'm escaped because I have zero chance of a fair trial. And if I have any opportunity to prove, at least for part of the people, I don't care about the people who are going to tell you you're going to be guilty no matter what. You abandon that. Okay? This is a lost battle. But at least the people who are ready to listen to you, at least you'll have the opportunity to talk to them. And this has to go through a fair trial. 
you know? And the only way I have a fair trial is certainly not in Japan. I have to be outside Japan. It happens that I'm in Lebanon today, but I can be in another country. I can be in Brazil. Brazil do not extradite its citizen. It does. France, uh, you know, France does not extradite its citizen. Uh, Lebanon does not extradite its citizen. I have three countries, and I'm blessed to be citizen of three countries who do not extradite the, the, their citizen. So in any one of the countries, I think I can have a fair trial. So I, I will learn from the Italian question and I won't ask details about the escape. But, but I'm sorry, who are you? AP, Associated ah, AP. Press. Thank you, thank you. The, so when people are calling it already the great escape, you've, you've heard all kinds. When was, the, when was the moment that made you realize it is time to escape? How did you reach that conclusion? And then now that you're here, how did you spend your time in Lebanon? You got here. What was the first thing you did? What are you planning to do for the next ride? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, when did I realize? When you had, to, you had to plan the escape. When did you start planning the escape? What made you? When, you when, you when, when, when first I lost any hope of fair trial, and I tried. I can tell you, I tried as much as possible. And then when I noticed that the trial was constantly postponed. Even though at the beginning the judge told us, I didn't tell you this, but he told us in the session that we had in November that he was going to try to start the second, the trial on the second charge in September 2020. I was very happy. I said, oh, finally, we're going to see the end of the tunnel. End of the tunnel, that means we're talking about 2022. Okay. But then he came on the 25th of December, which was Christmas Day, where we have a pre-trial. And he said, I'm afraid the prosecutor, the prosecutor cannot afford to have two trials at the same time. Too much work. So what did they say? They say, I cannot promise I'm going to start the second trial in September. So we said, when? Well, he said, I'm not going to commit, but certainly not before 2021. Postpone, postpone, postpone. And it's always the prosecutor who prevails. Whatever defense says doesn't, doesn't matter. And second, this is number one. Number two is, I want to see my wife. I mean, the judge was surprised I want to see my wife. But maybe for a lot of people, it would have been a, not a punishment not to see their wife, but for me, it was. <laughs> and they knew it. And they knew it because they have their correspondence with Carol. They knew I love Carol, and she is a pillar for me. They knew this because they had all the correspondence. They get to her email. They, they, they were not supposed to have the email. They were not supposed to take her phone. They took everything. They knew all of this. And because they knew all of this, they say, OK, we're going to put him on his knee. We're going to cut him from his wife. And they were right. They put me on my knees. So when I've seen that I couldn't see Carol, and I didn't have any, any horizon to see my wife and have a normal life, I said, what's left? What's left? I have to leave. I have nothing here. Lebanon. What did you do in Lebanon? What did you do? Okay, in so Lebanon? let's see. No, Mr. Okay, Hall, I don't see. I don't see. I don't see. Who has a microphone? Sky News Arabia, Darin Helwe. لما اخترت لبنان هل حصلت على ضمانات أمنية أو سياسية وما اخترت بلد دنيا تحصل على جنسيته و. واليوم كارلوس غصن من ممن يخ في إجراءات أمنية مشددة اليوم شفناها حكيت أنك ب باليابان كنت تمشي لحالك من دون مرافقة ممن يخاف اليوم كارلوس غصن بلبنان وهل قادر على الحصول على كل المستندات الموجودة بطوكيو لا تقديمها إلى القضاء اللبناني اللي قلت أنك يعني مستعد في القضاء في عدة سؤالات هون خلينا نبلش أول واحدة لا 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 نسيت الأولين شو هي أول سؤال ممن تخاف اليوم حصل ضمانات وممن تخاف لا الأمن مشدد لأنه بعد إيطاليا بعد إيطاليا لا لأنه يعني الأمن مشدد على أنت برأس قدام البيت اللي كنت أنا بدي روح فيه شفتي كم صحافي فيه وكم كاميرا فيه يعني أنا بدي دافع عن نفسي كمان بدي دافع عن حياتي هلا ما بذكر رح تضل هيك يعني بعد جمعتين ثلاثة معقول تختفي هلا أنا ما بذكر إنه في خطر علي بلبنان ما بذكر بس مش معناتها إنه مش راح اقدر يعني اخذ احتياطات حتى ما يصير في شيء شفتي كيف بس اسئله سؤال اخر سؤال هل قادرون على الحصول على كل المستندات اللازمه لا تقدمها للقضاء اللبناني انا انا المحاميه تبعوني مثل ما بتعرفي باليابان عندهم مستندات كثيره 
وعدة هالمستندات مرقوهم للمحامية تبعوا لي بلبنان وراح عم يكفوا يشتغلوا معهم، يعني أنا بفكر إنه عدة المستندات هلا انتبهي البروسيكيوتور ما أعطونا كل شيء شفت كيف؟ بعد عندهم شيء بعد عندهم أشياء بس بالعادة اللي بيعطوك إياه بالآخر هو الشغلة اللي اللي من مصلحتك يعطوك أول شيء كل شيء ضدي بعدين ببلشوا يعطوك الأشياء مجبورين يعطوها اللي بمصلحتك، يعني أنا ماني كثير خايف من اللي جاي لأنه اللي جاي رح يكون إلى مصلحتك Monsieur Gaun, s'il vous plaît. Valeurs actuelles. Alors, attendez. Euh, non, Monsieur Gaun, s'il vous plaît. Euh, on a bien compris que vous n'aviez pas reçu... Euh, madame, sou... madame, si vous pouvez juste nous dire qui vous êtes. Valeurs actuelles. Ah, merci. Euh, on a bien compris que vous n'aviez pas reçu le soutien que vous pouviez attendre du gouvernement français. Non, je n'ai pas dit ça. Enfin, non, je dis nous avons bien ah, compris. Vous avez compris, c'est autre chose. <rire> Aujourd'hui, qu'est-ce que vous demandez à Emmanuel Macron et au gouvernement français Qu'est-ce que je demande Qu'est-ce que vous leur demandez, oui. Bah, rien du tout. Vous attendez rien de... Je n'ai rien demandé. Non mais, non, mais vous me posez une question. Vous me dites, qu'est-ce que vous demandez au gouvernement français Je ne demande rien au gouvernement français. Puisque le gouvernement français a dit présomption d'innocence, ce que je crois, et je crois que quand le président de la République a des présomptions d'innocence, je le crois. Mais quand d'autres responsables en France disent présomption d'innocence et ont un body language de « il est coupable », ça, je ne suis pas d'accord. Où on est d'accord et on est convaincu de la présomption d'innocence et on doit être en ligne avec cette conviction, mais on ne peut pas dire on est pour la présomption d'innocence. On dit il est coupable sur la base d'audits intérimaires, sur la base d'informations qui n'ont pas été contredites et dans lesquelles moi-même je n'ai pas été interrogé. Ça, je ne suis pas d'accord. Ou, ou bien vous dites je ne crois pas à la présomption d'innocence. Je ne crois pas à la présomption d'innocence. Hein? Dans ce cas-là, je comprends ça. Mais vous ne pouvez pas dire je suis pour la présomption d'innocence. Mais finalement, avec un clin d'œil, il est coupable et on va le charger alors qu'il n'y a rien. Alors vous disiez vous-même qu'il y avait quelque chose pour... Il n'y a rien pour moi. Il y a peut-être une enquête, c'est possible. Mais évidemment, ces enquêtes, elles viennent d'où Elles viennent de l'intérieur de Renault. Alors vous imaginez que moi, j'ai des contacts avec beaucoup de gens à l'intérieur de Renault. Et je sais ce qu'il y a dans ces rapports. Donc je ne suis pas inquiet sur ce plan. Monsieur Gohn, s'il vous plaît. Euh, Monsieur Gohn. Pour Libération, s'il vous plaît. Libération, oui. Franck Boisis, j'aurais deux questions, s'il vous plaît, Monsieur Gaune. Justement, à propos de la justice, vous avez dénoncé l'iniquité de la justice japonaise. Vous n'avez peut-être pas le même sentiment sur la justice française. Il y a deux enquêtes pénales qui sont ouvertes au parquet national financier à Paris. Est-ce que si vous êtes convoqué par un juge d'instruction français, vous répondrez à cette convocation C'est ma première question. La deuxième, les Français ont découvert que depuis 2012, vous n'étiez plus résident fiscal en France, alors que vous dirigez pendant ces années-là un fleuron français et depuis cette date, la France a décidé de prendre une disposition législative oui. pour imposer la résidence fiscale à tous les dirigeants de grandes entreprises. Oui. Je voudrais savoir ce que vous en pensez et si vous pouvez nous expliquer pourquoi vous n'étiez plus résident fiscal en France depuis 2012. D'accord. Merci. Alors, on commence pour la, la première question, c'était Une convocation potentielle d'un magistrat français. Bah, écoutez, elle n'a pas lieu pour l'instant. Hein. Moi, je suis au courant de rien. J'ai mes avocats qui sont là. Euh, il est évident qu'à partir du moment où la justice française demande à me parler, je vais me présenter à la justice française. Je n'ai rien à me reprocher. Au contraire, moi, c'est ce que je demande. Hein. Ce que je ne demande pas, c'est qu'on m'accuse sans m'interroger. Ce qui a été fait largement, largement, sur la base d'audits truqués, truqués, sur lesquels on ne m'a même pas posé la question, dans lesquels la démarche est absolument discutable, quel que soit le standard de l'audit que, que l'on examine. Bon, ça, c'est sur le premier point. Le deuxième point, vous pensez bien que moi, j'ai changé de résidence en 2012, je n'ai pas changé toute seule. Pour, quand vous changez de résidence, vous vous adressez à l'administration fiscale, vous allez expliquer pourquoi vous changez de résidence, vous allez dire où vous allez, et c'est l'administration fiscale qui fait un outil fiscal, qui a été fait dans mon cas, et qui vous donne, euh, après, bon, en disant, bon, mais effectivement, il n'y a rien, vous pouvez faire ce que vous voulez. C'est ce qui s'est passé. Donc maintenant, on vient dire, ah, un patron d'une grande entreprise française doit être fiscalisé en France, très bien, la loi a changé, eh ben, et les patrons français devront agir en fonction de la loi, c'est tout. Mais moi, ce que je peux vous dire, c'est qu'en 2012, je n'ai pas fait en catimini, je me suis adressé aux autorités, j'avais d'ailleurs un fiscaliste qui l'a fait, il a demandé toutes les autorisations. J'ai expliqué pourquoi j'allais le faire. Je vous rappelle qu'en 2012, c'était une situation dans laquelle on était en train de créer des, des synergies de l'Alliance. Donc il était très important pour moi d'apparaître comme étant plus à Amsterdam qu'à Paris pour éviter de froisser les sensibilités japonaises. Ce qui, au départ, tout le monde pensait que c'était quelque chose de fabriqué, mais on sait qu'aujourd'hui, ça n'était pas du tout fabriqué. C'est la raison pour laquelle j'ai été à Amsterdam. J'ai passé beaucoup de temps à Amsterdam. Tout le travail de l'Alliance se faisait à Amsterdam. Donc voilà. Alors maintenant, on revient là-dessus. Il y a une nouvelle loi. On applique la loi. Voilà. Oui. Alors, please. Financial Times. Mr. Rosson, do you think that the Alliance can succeed without you? I think yes. No, no. Frankly, I, I, I think, yes, the Alliance can succeed without me. 
but the alliance has to follow some rules. The alliance is not going to work with consensus. That's, I can tell you. And for the moment, they all think that consensual decision making is one way to make the alliance live. It's wrong. And you know who's wrong and who's right? Look at the results. That's the only way you're going to know who is right and who is wrong in a business. You look at the results. You look at the growth, you look at the bottom line, and you look at the evolution. Well, when I look at what happened for the last 13 months, with everything that happened, I'm not reassured really about the future of the lines. Yes. Monsieur Gunn, James André, pour France 24. Alors, attendez, Monsieur, là-bas, oui. Ah bon, vous avez dans la parole, allez-y. Ben oui. <rire> allez-y, 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 allez-y. Donc oui, James André pour France 24, je voulais simplement savoir votre... Votre vie, évidemment, était passée au crible suite à cette affaire dans les médias, partout. On vous a présenté souvent euh, comme euh, ayant, on va dire, euh, atteint un niveau où vous, vous étiez déconnecté des réalités. Il vous est arrivé ce, que, ce qui vous est arrivé, ça change évidemment un homme. Euh, quand vous repensez à cette période-là, qu'est-ce que vous pensez Et qu'est-ce qu que vous auriez à dire sur cette image qu'on a dépassée oh, Non, mais, non, mais ce n'est pas une question d'image. Euh, moi, il y a eu des tournants Merci. dans ma vie. J'ai fait des choix. Il y en a certains que je regrette. C'est tout. Ce n'est pas une question de, de comment je vis ou pourquoi je vis, etc. J'ai eu des tournants, j'ai eu des décisions importantes à faire, et dans certaines décisions, j'ai fait le mauvais choix. Je vous dis, aujourd'hui, euh, on parlait de General Motors. Quand Steve Ratner m'a proposé de devenir le patron de General Motors en 2009, et que j'ai refusé de prendre le job par fidélité à Renault et Nissan, j'ai fait une connerie. Parce que je serai aujourd'hui patron aux états unis Ma Marie Barra, qui est patron de General Motors, a gagné euh, 26 ou 27 millions de dollars l'année dernière. Il n'y a pas eu une ligne dans un journal là-dessus elle, elle vit très bien, euh, elle est une citoyenne respectée, elle a un job beaucoup plus facile parce qu'elle n'avait qu'une entreprise à gérer, elle est dans son propre pays. Moi, je n'étais pas dans mon pays, je travaillais au travers des continents, tout le monde était très content que je fasse ce boulot, et maintenant, on vient me dire, ah, M. Gaune, vous voyagez beaucoup, ah, M. Gaune, vous touchez beaucoup d'argent, ah, M. Gaune, ceci ou cela, alors qu'on était très content que je mette en place ces mesures de façon à pouvoir vivre en tant que patron de plusieurs entreprises. C'est ça que je regrette. J'aurais dû faire des choix plus simples. Bon... J'ai fait cela, je les assume. Donc, moi, c'est plutôt dans ce sens-là. Il y a eu des tournants, j'ai pris des décisions. Certaines décisions que j'ai prises, je suis OK. D'autres décisions, je me suis dit, ça fait une conne. I'm sorry uh, Olha, o problema é que você sair do Japão para ir para o Brasil, você tem que parar em algum lugar. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, é, eu sei, eu sei, mas não vou, não vou, não vou, não vou mais fazer mais comentários sobre isso. Oui. Mr. Gunn, oui. New York Times, um, do you really think you can clear your name in front of an international audience, given that there are widespread perceptions that Lebanon's judicial system is corrupt and uh, not independent? I'm sorry, who's saying that? Uh, there are widespread perceptions around the world that uh, the Lebanese justice system is not up to uh, handling a trial such as yours. Do you really think that you can clear your name in front of an international audience? Okay, no, no I understand. First, I don't agree with you. I don't agree with you. Uh, I think we are very competent people in Lebanon. Uh, but frankly, when it comes to corrupt system, my first idea is not about Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, ITN uh, Television News of the UK. Uh, Mr. Gohan, I know, you, I understand you don't want to talk about the manner of your escape for fear perhaps of implicating uh, friends and, and colleagues. But it's a moment of great drama. Can you tell us your feelings, your emotion when you got into the packing case, your emotions when you got on the plane to freedom? Uh, I, I told you when, from November 19, 2018, to the 30th of December 2019 until I met my wife, who was the first person I met when I arrived at the house of her parents in Lebanon. I was numb. I numbed myself. I had no feeling. I try not to have feeling. Because when you have feeling, you're in danger when you are in a situation like this. So if you tell me what are your feelings, yes, obviously, I was nervous, I was tense, I was anxious. Uh, I was hopeful, but frankly, I spent a period of time, I don't know, probably people who are specialized in this can explain to you, I was like numb. I've been like a kind of nightmare for the 13 months. Started November 19, finished the 30th of December, you know, and the nightmare started start when I saw the face of the prosecutor, and it ended when I saw the face of my wife. 
Would you recommend a packing case as a means of travel? I'm sorry? Would you recommend a packing case as a means of travel? Okay, maybe five more minutes and then we're going to have to stop. Yeah, okay, okay, hands, 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 hands. And then you, hands, hands. No, I'm Hans. No, Hans. He's Hans. Thank you, Mr. Gohan. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is about, um, you paint a really uh, sorry picture about the state of the alliance and, and where it's going. You're a, you state your reputation as a revival artist, uh, made that reputation at, uh, at uh, Nissan. C can you give us a three-step program to how you would revive the alliance if you were still in charge at this point? If you were parachuted in there, what would you do to reboot this alliance? What needs to happen? Second question, hold on, I'll, I'll jump in with a second. How do you feel about Renault? What, what are your feelings towards Renault? Did they rush to judgment too quickly uh, and uh, evict you from office uh, without due process? So you say a lot about Nissan, but what are your feelings about Renault? Yeah. Uh, the first thing is wh what I would do, obviously I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you what would be my program, but I always said there is no problem without a solution and you can always fix the situation no matter what it is. But what I can tell you is what I will do is completely different from what's being done. So that's for sure. Uh, the second point is I'm not talking about Renault because today the topic is not about Renault. But today the topic is about uh, I left Japan. I'm explaining to you why I left Japan and everything which happened to me in Japan which is linked to Nissan and somehow which is linked to the lines. Renault is not in the, in, in the loop. That's why I didn't talk about, about Renault. And that's why I'm not intending to talk not to deviate the attention from the main, from the main topic. Sir. Monsieur Gaune, Julien Fautra pour la radio RTL. Euh, on parlait de l'embauche de votre sœur. Euh, C'est peut-être une erreur, peut-être une faute, j'en sais rien. Ma question porte sur la moralisation du droit des affaires, des affaires. Est-ce qu'on peut encore faire des affaires comme il y a 5 ans, comme il y a 10 ans Non. Non, non, on ne peut pas. Euh, on ne peut pas. Aujourd'hui, il y, euh, y a beaucoup de suspicions sur la gouvernance, il y a beaucoup de rêves. Tant mieux d'ailleurs. Mais il faut savoir que l'envers de ça, c'est qu'il y a une certaine agilité, il y a une certaine rapidité qui sera perdue, c'est tout. Mais maintenant, ce sont des choix. Les sociétés acceptent de dire, ça va aller plus lentement, mais on va respecter les règles. Très bien. Euh, avant, il fallait aller vite pour saisir des opportunités, mais pour aller vite, on était obligé euh, de prendre un certain nombre de, de courts circuits. Moi, je ne dis pas du tout que qu'est-ce qui est bien, qu'est-ce qui n'est pas bon. Ce que je dis, c'est que une fois qu'on a défini les règles, à ce moment-là, il faut les suivre. Voilà. Mais c'est vrai que Faire du business aujourd'hui par rapport à il y a 5 ans ou 10 ans, c'est très différent. Madame. Oui. Le procès du procès. Pardon. Oui, votre avocat nous a expliqué qu'il comptait faire le procès du procès. Il nous a décrit les conditions que vous-même avez repris de votre, de votre détention. Et au Liban, certains euh, nous ont dit qu'ils vous considéraient comme le Dreyfus de ce pays. Euh, Est-ce que vous allez contre-attaquer Comment Ce sera ma première question double. Et la, der la deuxième et la dernière, comment voyez-vous l'avenir Comment est-ce que vous, comptez, comptez, vous allez contre-attaquer Comment est-ce que vous voyez l'avenir, vous, en tant que Carlos Ghosn Oui, alors attendez, moi je ne comprends pas la question, je suis le Dreyfus du Liban. Je n'ai pas compris, ça veut dire quoi ça C'est les Libanais qui vous, qui, vous, qui vous... Non mais qu'est-ce que ça veut dire non, mais Ça veut dire que vous êtes victime, c'est que ça veut dire que vous êtes victime d'une... Oui, ça veut dire que vous êtes victime d'une... Oui, tout à fait, ils ont... Voilà, alors je voudrais savoir... Attendez, madame, quand vous voyez le film... Non mais franchement, il faut... Il faut... Non, mais je comprends que des gens ne m'aiment pas ou disent « Ah, c'est tant, tant mieux pour lui, etc. Il en a suffisamment profité, etc. » Bon, je comprends ça. Mais quand vous voyez le film, une arrestation sur une non-déclaration d'un revenu non touché et non décidé, ça fait quand même un peu louche, non Vous ne trouvez pas D'arrêter un, un patron d'une grande entreprise sans, sans même l'avoir convoqué pour lui dire « Écoutez, vous pouvez nous expliquer, on a tel document. » Rien du tout. Vous allez en prison vous allez en prison et après on commence à faire l'enquête. Vous ne trouvez pas que c'est un peu bizarre bah, bon, Donc quand on dit que je suis victime, oui, moi j'estime que j'étais victime. J'aurais quand même eu le droit à une explication à la limite qu'on m'arrête après. Mais on ne peut pas m'arrêter après m'expliquer. Voilà les raisons pour lesquelles on vous arrête alors que ce n'est même pas un crime. Enfin je dirais, ce n'est pas moi qui le dis. Ce sont tous les professeurs de droit qu'on a consultés, y compris au Japon, qui disent on ne comprend pas qu'on soit arrêté là-dessus. Il n'y a jamais eu de cas avant. On n'arrête pas quelqu'un 
sur un cas qui n'a jamais existé, sur une interprétation d'une loi, alors qu'il n'y a eu aucun dommage pour l'entreprise. Mais l'argent n'a pas été payé. Où est le dommage Vous voyez, c'est ça ce qui est incompréhensible. Sur le grand. Alors, sur le attendez, grand. on va prendre une dernière question. Une dernière sur question. Sur le grand. Allez-y, monsieur. André Neto, pour le Estado de São Paulo. Allez, Estado de São Paulo, oui. Fora de São Paulo. Fora de São Paulo. Sim. O senhor protagonizou uma fuga uh, cinematográfica. O senhor hoje retomou a sua liberdade de expressão. Uh, o senhor acredita que isso seja o início de um grande comeback? O senhor acredita que pode voltar a ser o titã da indústria uh, automobilística, como já foi no passado? E, segunda questão, o senhor acha que a sua prisão mudou, de alguma forma, a história da indústria automobilística, pelo menos europeia, nos últimos anos? É, olha, ah, é, 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 é muito eu poderia cedo, só é muito completar... Cedo, é muito cedo para falar de um comeback. É muito cedo. Eu preciso, eu preciso ganhar mais força, passar tempo com, com minha família, com meus amigos, para restabelecer um pouco a energia e a força que eu tive. Ok? Então, so, por enquanto, eu não tenho planos. Isso não significa que não vou ter planos daqui, daqui, daqui a pouco. Oui. Justamente. Justamente. Só para saber se o senhor Bonjour. poderia, por exemplo, criar uma empresa de consultoria no curto médio prazo. O senhor, que planos não, não. que o senhor teria? Ou talvez Bonjour, ir para o Brasil Gondi. até? Bonjour, Monsieur Gond. Não, não vai, não tem plano, não tem plano para o futuro. Yeah. Bonjour, Monsieur Gond. Oui, bonjour, euh, Rola Tartici, de complément d'enquête sur France 2. Euh, on a récemment interviewé un de vos amis qui nous a dit que votre principale qualité, c'était l'éthique. Est-ce euh, que vous avez l'impression d'avoir eu le sens de l'éthique quand vous avez euh, profité euh, personnellement de, du cadeau du château de Versailles j ai, j ai pas... Du cadeau du château de Versailles Du château de Versailles. Oui. Versailles. Je ne pas... comprends pas. Ah oui, vous dites que c'est un problème d'éthique Oui. Non, mais attendez. Euh, enfin, je madame, vous pose la question, je n'affirme rien. Euh, oui, bon, je pense que les, 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 mes juristes sont là, ils pourront vous expliquer quelle est la, 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 la position. Euh, je ne pense pas que c'était un cadeau, parce que moi, j'ai tout payé. Donc, on m'a dit, vous savez, de temps en temps, vous achetez une voiture, on vous dit, on vous offre, bon, vous achetez la voiture, vous payez ça, mais on vous offre ceci. Bon, est-ce que vous dites, ah, c'est un problème éthique, je ne peux pas accepter. Vous dites, vous allez acheter une voiture, vous offre une option. Vous dites, ah non, monsieur, je ne peux pas accepter l'option, parce que moi, j'ai demandé, disposer de la salle. J'ai dit, je prends vos traiteurs, je prends vos vins, je paye tout. Je, je paye tout, je, je paye tout. Et ils m'ont dit, bon, vous offre la salle. Bon, moi, j'ai considéré que c'était un geste commercial, mais pas gratuit. Ça faisait partie d'un package que j'avais payé. Bon, mais, et donc, euh, voilà la situation. Alors maintenant, je découvre que ça a été réduit ce n'est pas que Renault a payé, c'est qu'il y avait un crédit, d'ailleurs, qui n'a pas été utilisé par Renault, euh, euh, qui a été réduit de temps. Euh, pour éviter tout problème, j'ai dit que je suis prêt à payer, c'est tout. Donc, je pense pas. Euh, si je pas... pensais qu'il y avait un problème d'éthique, je ne l'aurais pas fait. Ça, c'est sûr. Bon. Excusez-moi, Marie Linton de M6. Euh, j'ai été dans les prisons japonaises. Oui. J'ai beaucoup enquêté pendant un an sur le système judiciaire japonais. Vous décrivez la dureté du système judiciaire. Vous décrivez la dureté de votre résidence surveillée, on a du mal à comprendre comment vous avez pu vous échapper si le régime de surveillance était aussi strict. Ça, c'est la première question. Et la deuxième question, c'est est-ce que vous, vous ne craignez pas que le système judiciaire devienne, japonais devienne encore plus dur maintenant que vous vous êtes échappé C'est-à-dire que d'autres ne bénéficient pas d'une libération sous caution, par exemple Oui. Moi, franchement, je peux vous dire que si on m'avait donné les signaux d'un fair trial, si on a laissé ma femme venir vivre avec moi, j'avais aucune raison de quitter le Japon. C'était l'endroit... Non, non, c'était l'endroit... C'était l'endroit idéal pour me défendre. Le Japon est l'endroit idéal. C'est là où l'accusation est venue, j'étais prêt à me défendre. La seule chose que je demandais, c'est qu'on me donne un petit peu d'espoir que j'allais être traité de manière fair. C'est tout, c'est tout ce que je demandais. Et que d'un autre côté, je ne comprenais pas pourquoi, non seulement on m'interdisait de voir ma femme, incompréhensible, euh, mais, mais euh, le fait que j'étais interdit de voir ma femme, j'ai compris que le président Macron en avait parlé à, au Premier ministre Abbé, je sais que le président libanais en a parlé au, 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 au Premier ministre Abbé. Il y a plein de gens qui ont parlé au Premier ministre Abbé. Bon, ça n'a eu aucun effet. Mais pourquoi Qu'est-ce qu'elle a fait Et puis maintenant, cette affaire de, 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 de euh, demande d'arrêt pour, pour, pour Carole, parce qu'ils disent, on soupçonne qu'elle n'ait pas dit dans sa déclaration d'il y a neuf mois qu'elle connaissait quelqu'un qu'elle avait rencontré. On lance un mandat international d'arrêt contre une personne pour ça Enfin, je ne sais pas, moi, si ça vous paraît normal, moi, ça ne me paraît pas du tout normal. Je me dis, il y, y, y a une charge ici, il y a une concentration qui est extrêmement préoccupante. Alors, écoutez, 
Je ne vais pas vous retenir plus longtemps. On a encore... Moi, j'ai beaucoup de chaînes télé, euh, télé et de et d'interviews à faire. Je voudrais qu'on arrête. Oui, le document. Où est-ce qu'il est, mon document Oui, je, je voulais... Bon. Non, non, c'est bon, c'est bon. On arrête, on arrête, on arrête. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you. Thank you.